of Robots and Animals. That's the subject for today. Today we discuss the wonderful world of fighting robots based on animals. Robots that look like animals and or have animal characteristics. I built a few myself, but we're not here to talk about mine. We're here to talk about the ones that inspired us in the first place. My first guest today is somebody who is recognisable for his reviews of classic Robot Wars, and more recently he's been doing a user's guide to the newcomers for BattleBots 2020. I've had the pleasure of taking part in some of his podcasts in the past, and now I get to the return the favour. It's James Nicholson, aka Jim Jimatic. Hello, Jim. Hello there. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, very nice, to, a very good subject matter today, actually. I'm looking forward to talking about some of these robots, so uh, thank you for having me on. Um, it's, I think this is going to be a good one. And my second guest today, um, last but by no means least, he's back. It's John o. Dixon. Hello. Howdy. How are you doing? Hey, not too bad. Good to hear from you again. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, this is a, certainly an interesting little sort of topic that we're going to be looking at, because, I mean, this kind of stuff was really prevalent, in, especially in the early series, which has got some of my all-time favourite designs, some of which we will be covering. So, yeah, I can't wait to get into it. Absolutely. Now, before we continue, we're going to set out some criteria. The robot must obviously be based on an animal. A robot that has an animal's name but otherwise bears no resemblance doesn't count. If it bears little resemblance, it will gain a quick honourable mention. If the robot does have an animal shape but is vague, it is also eligible for an honourable mention. We will also only cover robots from the main competition of Robot Wars Series 1-10. to um, So unfortunately that means we can't cover BattleBots, so no Nelly the Elliebot or Kraken or um, Predator or Foxtrot, sadly. But there'll be plenty more for us to talk about, I'm sure. Oh no, we can't talk about Ribot. How sad. <laughs> Maybe, maybe one day, maybe one day. Anyway, we're going to start off back from the very beginning in Robot Wars Series 1. The year is 1997, first uh, aired in 1998, of course. And the first animal-themed robots emerged in this series. The very first two um, proper ones were Satan the Featherweight and Eubank the Mouse, the lightweight stock robot. I mean, let's be honest. Satan was the best-looking robot in its heat. <laughs> I mean... I can't argue with that. It had the sort of the flaming hair sort of decal on the top with the funky stickers on the side. And they stuck a smoke machine inside it as well. <laughs> I always found Satan quite an interesting case, simply because the robot that we were presented with in the opening parade and in the pit intro was substantially different from what we actually saw competing in all the events. So from what I saw, the, um, the zoo horns around the side bay got removed, I believe, and the nose, that disappeared. And uh, So yeah, it changed quite substantially, and I don't think there was much in the way of explanation as for why that was. Mm, they said it had a laser-guided sight in the eye patch as well, although lasers were something that was a bit... Um pokey around that time because well we never really saw them again afterwards did we yeah no we don't see them much um i mean they can thank demolisher in a way because if it wasn't for demolisher they would have got sawn in half by matilda mm. so... <laughs> yeah i think it was wards given how easily matilda just got right through it and that's probably the only thing she could cut in series one and demolisher was made of titanium uh, but it did well in the gauntlet it's managed to outmove the house robots and it did okay in the trial as well if it had beat Demolisher, it would have faced Cunning Plan, and I don't think it would have been much of a match for Cunning Plan. Well, it would have gotten a match, but I imagine it would have gone mm. to judges, and it probably wouldn't have been as quick as it would have ultimately been. It's also, it was all good. at the end of the day, no matter who won this heat, they were going against robots like Roadblock. So yeah. <laughs> they had no chance of winning the series. They never came back after that, I don't think. Yep, their only appearance, yep. um, including my favourite team member, according to the wiki, unidentified female. Ah, oh, yeah, that, that, I think it might have been their mum or something. Probably. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's like, like a family team, but um, looks-wise, I quite like it. You know. oh, not, not a bad start. Talk of the Devil appears in the following episode, Heat E. JP describes it as looking like some kind of burnt pig. Yeah, then again, JP kind of had some interesting names for all kinds of things. I remember him calling a broken off axe looking like a con earbud on one occasion. So, oh, yeah. yeah. On to the mouse, which was the uh, in the last heat, and it was a stock robot. Uh, Vendetta against the stock robots in Series 1. I mean, they would be okay if they didn't get past the first round, but they... Yeah. This robot removed Elvis from the competition, which I'm very sad about. 
Yeah, I was thinking about that as well. Hey ho. Yeah, I mean, you know the most. I mean, this was originally like a robot they brought to America as one of their little kind of like. I think Grunt was also because a lot of the stock robots like yeah, they were brought there just to kind of compete over there. And yep. from what I saw of like the little behind the scenes video about Series One, it, it didn't. <laughs> Eubank didn't do very well. They got. Yeah. I seem to remember it falling on its face. Yeah, gr- gr- yeah it falls in its face the intro and then mysteriously breaks down in the trial. And I think <laughs> they are for uh, you bank the mouse. One thing I will say about you bank the mouse is aesthetically it looks brilliant. I love you, Ank. I did like the look. Hmm. Yeah, as, yeah, as far as the looks to a mouse go, I think they they did as good as they could have done with the pyramid. It's like one pyramid, like it's like two pyramids on top of each other. I think the more successful pyramid robot than Ugly Bot, shall we say? <laughs> Definitely. There's also one fact I quite like about um, talk. Um, sorry, you about the mouse, sorry, is that that um, it was the only stock robot where the driver was later the captain of another team. Because yeah, because he he was challenger, I believe. Steve Dove, very good looking robot in the series too. Yeah, I quite liked it. Obviously, the, uh, the, other person, the other person who drove WYSIWYG was also um, on Cruella team. We never saw uh, the guy who drove, drove Grunt again. Matthew Dickinson. Mm. So we move on to Series 2 now, and I think the f- first proper animal-themed robot that we encounter in the series does not come until Heat D, in the shape and form of Millian Bug. And can I just say, this is definitely one of the best examples of uh, an animal-themed robot done right, I would say. I mean, the design is like no other robot done before or since in Raw yeah. Wars. The articulation. And it won best design, I think, in Series 2 for good reason. It was uh, most original entry. entry. Oh, original entry, that was it. Mm. Still deserved. So it had wooden mandibles at the front with a circular saw in the middle. Um, and, it articula- and the body articulated, which was quite interesting. And it was a p- play on the Millennium Bug, which a lot of people were talking about at the time, back in 1998-99. Hmm. I mean, a lot of people praise Shunt for his like superb headshots of like Atlas and those kind of things. But he got Millennium Bug right in the iris of the, of the eye, like straight in. Yeah, he did that to Panic Attack as well, which we'll cover later. <laughs> it looks so painful. In this series, of course, Millie Ann Bug also had the Kevlar hair, which Sergeant Bash took a liking to torturing. Yeah, he got bullied in the in the football. Yeah, like, his did, whole, it, whole life had okay, been bullied. Go, did okay in the gauntlet, and then in the football, those mandibles would have been good at picking up the ball and pushing it around, but it got bullied in the football to the point where Elvis was able to just saunter past and eventually score at Millie Ann's expense, which was quite sad. I th- I think partially the sh- the design of the robot was where its major disadvantage was because it couldn't really maneuver as, as quickly as like Aemoth or Razor or something, so it kind of just a bit hard to control. Trapped. It did have its um yeah much wider turning circle than most of the others. It was kind of competing with. Um, came back in series three um, with a new design, like new artwork, which I actually much prefer to the old one. It looks much more fun. But, you know, with the smiley face on it and everything. They get rid of the saw, though, and replace it with some spikes. Which you couldn't really see, but... Uh... Now, I'll say, although I am sort of in agree with uh, Philippa, though, is that I missed the hair. I missed the hair yeah. in Series 3. That was the one thing I wanted to bring back, and I was like, oh, yeah. Well. Oh, well. I'll tell you what, though. Uh, Millian's appearance in Series 3 was genuinely quite impressive. I liked... I liked... I mean, Millie was drifting in it. Only five. It was running rings about around Bumbledore, but on control and aggression and style. It was looking really, really promising. And then it drove in the pit. Silly, <laughs> silly. I mean, but, it's really sad because we would have seen this thing a bit more in series three because there was potentially with things like I think it was part of the uh, ta- the tag team event plans, and then that got cancelled because of um, backstage issues <laughs> that happened yeah. in series three. So we, I think I can't. I think this thing was going to come for who its partner was. I remember it being quite an interesting one, but I remember the Amber was definitely going to be competing in a side event, which would have might like to see a bit more of, but she only got to see it in Series 3 for this brief amount of time, but it was a very aggressive amount of time while it was there. If it had got past the first round, how do you think it would have fared? I mean, Ultor was going to be its next victim, and honestly, Ultor, it's okay. I mean, Ultor just kind of got lucky that both its opponents weren't that great in it. It was a bit under us. 
Um, it could have, re- if it had gone against Big Brother in the final, it would have drove up its wedge or even drove up Ultor perhaps because Ultor wasn't, was quite a gentle, sloppy robot as well. True. Although a bigger brother, a big, big Brother's um, wedge was definitely a lot better than Ultor's. In fact, they got under Ultor quite a few times. It would have been a lot more entertaining to watch than Bumblebot anyway. Yes, although yeah, so we wouldn't we wouldn't have got Dare Metal having a nice crowning moment of glory and soaring bubble bots hammer off. Indeed. Um but then it came back in series four, um, where it faced Pussycat and Reptiron. Managed to qualify after Reptiron um well, fuel lines got ripped and it caught fire and broke down and that was the end of that. So then she faces Razor in round two. I mean there's never a sadder image than that. There's like the image on the wiki. Of just Milian with one wheel left and Ray's just taken everything off it and it's just it's all battered. You can barely see the face on it now. The hair's all like flat and it's it's I think possibly one of Ray's I think one of Ray's greatest moments in the entire series. Just how methodically it took all the wheels off it apart from one. It was it was an exhibition. It wasn't a fight, really, was it? Nah. <laughs> I think JP said it was like a kid's pulling legs off a spider. It was it was grisly, but in a comical way and everything. And the team couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the robot itself didn't get damaged that much. It was mostly just the wheels. They, yeah. got, they got a few nibbles on it, but apart from that, it was pretty much intact still, at least. And she was there at RoboNerds in 2019. Oh, that was so fun to see that see that robot again. Incredible. Uh, and she's been about 20 years, so it was like, nice to see it back again. Yes, it was, and with the wheels put back on too. So, yeah, good to see her, and with the hair. Um, shall we move on to the next one, then? Yes, indeed. Let's move on to Panic Attack, then, because that one had... A, won't go into such great detail with this one, of course. I'll be here all day. But anyway, Series 2 overall champion, um, with the spider motif on the, on the armour at the top, and with those spikes at the front, which looked a bit like spider fangs, if you like. Yeah, they, they, just like a lot of the robots in their heat in Series 2, they got pretty uh, screwed over by the ramp. At least three of them didn't barely got up the ramp half the time. Killalot held the ramp down, so Panic Hack just had to fly straight off the top of it and into the house robots. It did result in like both the eye being taken out, I mentioned before, but also it's kind yeah. of like b- bullet hole precision like hits that shouldn't made in Series like, just in like in a row. Like a machine gun, yeah. It was very precise. Yeah, because Shunt wasn't great in Series 2 in terms of his axe, but that was one of the few times he really shined. His axe was definitely better in Series 2 than in Series 1, but it wasn't until Series 3 where it really began to get punishing. I mean, also, let, lest we forget that Panic Attack um, competed in the one and only race-off in the um, in the, in the uh, semi-finals as well, which is both unfortunate and also interesting as well. I kind of wish that's how the trials had gone in, gone and gone in general. It reminds me a bit of like Robotica where they have two robots going at the same time. Mm. Good pushing robot as well. Uh, push its opponents um, down the pits many an occasion. Series 3, more slightly more streamlined, a, big, a chunkier design, a little bit more streamlined at the front. Bigger, much more spider-like spikes, which looked really good. And the self-writing mechanism, but really hard to control. But they f- fixed that for Series 4 and 5. And at the sloped sides and the skirts. Yeah, I, I don't mind Series 3 panels. I mean, obviously, just from going from Series 2 to Series 3. It's oppressive. And just, I guess, just me being used to the more modern version of Panic Attack, it's just weird seeing with it without the skirts at all. Yeah. It was great to actually watch Panic Attack kind of evolve year on year. It was, def- it was definitely one of those machines that you could kind of count on it upgrading mm. something. It would come back looking a little bit different and a little bit more refined. And it kind of kept that up for quite a few years. Definitely not so good for Series 6 or 7, though, sadly. Especially Series 6. I mean, even Kim Davis kind of wants to forget Panic Attack Gold. Yeah, he knew it was not a good robot when he brought in. Actually, I don't, I don't think it was supposed to compete originally. I don't think he was um, planning more series to go for Series 6. But then he kind of made this new version of it and thought, I'll just enter it anyway. And, I mean, Terahertz and Matilda kind of showed why it shouldn't have been there. It then comes back in Series 7 with Kevin Pritchard, who was on the team in Series 2, because Kim then joined the technical crew, and they replaced the self-writing mechanism. This was like the Series 5 version, uh, but now with uh, no self-writing mechanism, but with an anti-hammer top on instead, which really wasn't as good. No, I mean, I mean prior to obviously, it obviously wasn't the panic that I've seen before, but you also 
we'll be talking about it later. He also was the captain of um, yeah, of um, Panic Attack at Home, as I like to call it. We'll uh, get to that quite soon when we get to Series 3. Indeed. So now, moving on to Sting, a Scorpion-themed robot that competed in Heat H. What can we say about Sting? Sting was definitely one of my favourite looking robots, especially in Series 3. I mean, the Series 2 one looked great, especially with the layered kind of metal appearance that kind of went along the whole length of it. That was a really nice look for it. A very solid-looking robot, I would say. And then, of mm. course, they went for the whole um, kind of skeleton aesthetic for Series 3, which, I mean, artistically, it was one of my favourite robots in Series 3. Mm. I mean, I'm a fan of, like, it's like robots like something or tetanus 2. You know, those kind of ones that just kind of look like pieces of scrap put together. I love that kind of aesthetic. Um, was... Also, but by Series 2 standards... The original Sting was really well armored. Like, you know, Dead Metal could, couldn't even do anything to it apart from a little scratch. You know, it was quite layered. It would be like Technophobe because it had a lot of layered um, armor on it. And of course, we can't forget the very unique, the actual Sting itself on it, which is based off their cat's tail, I think. It was kind of deformed slightly, so it had a little curl to it. And I quite like they actually incorporated it into a robot, which is very impressive, I'd say. It was a highly animated looking little weapon. I mean, it was largely ineffective but it looked it moved nicely it did yeah. it walked until it walked so s3 could run it ra- it did okay in the gauntlet in series two went out in the football rounds after breaking down along with um, the other robots that were there series three pitted by deator wasn't it yeah it was deator's first ever victim of uh, which it you know which also includes robots like tornado so that's quite not a bad club to be in quite an unlucky draw really for sting sting to i would say it was not a bad first round loser at all definitely one of the better ones i would say well in general that heat was quite was stacked. stacked i mean you had facet firestorm deator even robots like shumi 2 and steel avenger weren't terrible no they weren't it wasn't really a awful robot in that heat i'd say for the most part apart from maybe like one we'll get onto later but it was an okay heat for the most part. I would certainly say so. So, moving on to the next robot, we have Rottweiler. And this one was the first robot that appeared from Dominic Rott, who would come back later with Constrictor. Um, and Rottweiler, well, it's, it's obviously got a dog theme to it. To ha- it's a big black po- robot with big pointy spikes at either end, but a dog collar of spikes all around it. Which, to kill a lot, love to clip. Yes, um, very painfully so. Uh, Too I, I will say though, I do. I think Dominic Rott was one of the kind of the most underrated like ch- children that appeared on Robot Wars because he was so enthusiastic. Like the entire he time, he was, de- he was definitely my favorite kids that appeared in the show and everything because he was enthusiastic and he took losing pretty well too, which was good. Hmm. Like his robot could have just got completely destroyed in the fir- in the gun, and he would have been just as happy if he won like the heat. Like he just seems so. He, like, he, like the best, one of the best clips is that reaction when he's told he's getting through to the first to the next round. He's like, I mean, he doesn't he's even believe it. Going. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he actually came to Robo Nerds. Would you believe he was there? Oh man, I completely missed him. Yeah, oh, he was there. Nice. He was there for a wee while. He looks just the same as he did in Robot Wars, but he's got a beard now. Yeah, he commented on the video I made back when they did the series. They, 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 his, his heat in series two, and he's you know talking about the. So he did behind the scenes a lot, and all. it was it was it was pretty nice actually. It was nice to hear from him because yeah, I really enjoyed really enjoyed watching him on the show. He was a great he was a great kid on it. He was yeah, good, good guy. I mean, as far as Rob Waller goes, it's um yeah, it's not one of those ones which um it has it's great in how it kind of takes a theme and adapts it into robot combat. That's something which um you kind of see a lot with animal theme robots, like especially the whole sort of spiky collar going going around it. That's a it's just a really nice touch. And I mean, I'm sure we'll see sort of more things like that. But yeah, Rottweiler is a good example of a robot which kind of does that in a quite a unique way. And it's also one of the three robots that went minus score in a, in any in a, in a trials. Yeah, minus 2.8 meters. That's uh... <laughs> interesting. So the mule, this was Roger Plant's first foray into Robot Wars, and it has kicking legs, hence its name. This thing is stacked. Like, I mean, there's a reason it won the Best Engineer Award. It's so much stuff. Compa- I mean, I mean, it's, it's not a compact robot, but it's got a lot. What, what it keeps in there is it's got three kicking legs. It's got, a, and it's also got a forklift on top of it. it could be seen as the fusion of its day. Hmm. Before spinners caught on. Hmm. 
I mean, it's also just really very strange. And yeah, go from like it's one of those like weird first robots. Like it's nothing like the big cheese or weird big cheese within in concept. It's so different. Like even so, I mean, one's based off cheese and one's based off a you know mule. So it's like so interesting, but. It was it's it's great to see how like much technology could go into that, even like in series two, yeah. Like how much you know? I mean, was it was it, was it a very effective robot? I mean, in terms of the weapons, not particularly, but it's the more the technological feat that went into it. I think is pretty impressive. I do remember it briefly appeared in the Real Robots magazine alongside the Big Cheese and Willy Big Cheese, and it did make quite a quite an effort to actually mention just how complex the machine it actually was. It's just uh, very, very clever what he's managed to um, put into something like that at a time like that when obviously components would have been a lot bigger in those days too. Yeah, I mean, when I made my Series 2 replicas in RA2, I think making it made me realise how much there was actually in the robot. Like, it made me appreciate it a lot more because I remember not remembering it too much. Like, because it, 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 its actual performance was, you know, was solid, but not like blowing your mind. But it, uh, I look back on it and I just think, you know what, I can appreciate a lot of my technology to that. I appreciate it more than something like with Big Cheese, which I like, but I like like that thing just a one note massive flip or it's out kind of robot, which is still impressive, but it's not as impressive as something so much technology gone into it. So we'll, yeah. we'll give a we'll give an honorable mention to the big cheese since it's got a cat mascot on it, but it's not a cat themed robot otherwise, so that's why we're not gonna cover that one. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So we're moving on to Armadillo. This is the last one that we cover in Series 2. It's a featherweight this time, built by Adam Clark, who competed in the main event with Corporal Punishment. Again, we didn't really see that much of it, but from what we saw in the few seconds we had, it's A, looks great, and B, I just like the way it moves. The little kind of t tail flicks that it kind of did just look really quite nice, in my opinion. Adam was always somebody who would like to go for all kinds of different original designs as each series went on. Um, Armadillo was certainly one of the cleverest designs, I would say. Yeah, I mean, it's a shame we never saw the actual, you know, doing it more. I'd, I'd, lo I'd love to have seen a heavyweight version of this particular robot to see how, how we could have scaled it up. I don't know if it would be possible or not, but it's just an interesting look of it. it has, again, it, it actually has some look to Sting, actually, just the way the armor is layered. But it's just, it's such a strange yet original design. Like, what? who would think to just make this little flicky tail that lifts upwards? Like, it's so smooth as well. It's like some kind of, like, prosthetic or something it's so well made and just like a lot of adam clark's robots they're so there's, there's there's originality to it and if they're not too original they're at least well engineered so it's a it's a great looking robot and like i said i'd love to have seen the heavyweight or even like a beetle weight version of this robot because that would be fun to see so adam clark if you're hearing this there's a challenge for you <laughs> Right, so honourable mentions, quickly, um, Razor, part bird, part reptile, Groundhog, which had the sort of Groundhog motif on it and everything, but ironically, it was very high off the ground. And Rampage with the Ram mascot on the front of it. So let's move on to Series 3. And Series 3, designs and indeed the robot kind of inspired designs kind of went a bit nuts. Uh, to the extent that we have one, two, three, four, we have, I would say, at least 20 different animal-themed robots. And uh, the actual aesthetics of these machines were getting kind of crazy as well, and we'll kind of cover some of them. Um, including, first up, is Red Dragon, which in my memory, looked brilliant with um, what they were able to do with kind of so little. Yeah, it's such a... It's so good for Series 3. Like, by a lot of the robots we're talking about later on in this list for Series 3, it's one of the most striking and unique ones, in my opinion. I mean, one of the things which I will always remember is Red Dragon's silhouette before they um, kind of called its name and they list up. Look, so if you actually had a look at it when it was kind of in the dark before the spotlight shone onto it, it was definitely one of those sort of more striking looking designs. Hmm, yes. Um, it's one of the ones I'd seemed to forget about as the series went on, strangely enough, but that's because it didn't really make much of an impression in its only battle where it broke down against Razor Blade. Yeah, it just it's one of the strangest breakdowns in Road Wars history. It just sort of it's just driving around the middle of the arena and then just stops. And, mm. just, and then obviously the, the, it, was a, it was a gas leak off of it that caused it, but... She's going to blow! Sure. <laughs> <laughs> also, they actually thought to put self-writers on the robot, which is very rare for Series 3, like having a, you know, proper self-writers on it, which is... I, I can't think of any robots 
many rotary robots other than flippers mm. that did have um, them. Believe it or not, I think Prize Fighter actually had a spe- especially added self rifle. Have, have, have the boxing yeah. glove pissed on the very top, which would turn it back over. Of course, his panic attack as well had a little self rifle bar on it as well. Baxi also had this big drill, which was on an arm that came up and down. Didn't self rifle the rock very well. No, it couldn't self rifle it. No. Uh, I mean, there's also one big thing about Red, Red Dragons. This thing, this thing went uh, to, on eBay fairly recently. Um, and it was apparently his listing was thirteen hundred and seventy eight pounds, mm. which is only twenty pounds lower than the cost of making the robot. It'd be <laughs> probably that t- build a brand new heavier robot from scratch at the low end. I mean, I like Red Dragon. If it was going for like one hundred fifty two hundred, I mean, given the fact it's such in great, it's such great condition even now, mm. I think it's worth a decent price. But I don't think it's worth over a grand. It's very much the kind of piece that would look very good in, say, roaming robots experience alongside all of their kind of display robots. Yeah, it's just nice to see a team actually look after their robot even to this day. Like, I mean, you get it with some robots, but then, especially ones from like um, Series 4 below, it's very rare to get a robot that's in perfect condition. I know Rex Garrett kept kept his robots in good condition, but. Uh, Cassie was there at his funeral, actually. Oh, was it? No, um, I know Recyclops is like a cover for like a um, sprinkler system or something. It was something like that in his garden that yeah. was all left of that robot. Your cycles, Recyclops. Pretty much, I mean, the robot started as recycling and it's kind of become recycled to another purpose, so it's kind of appropriate. So, moving on to Pitbull, this was the winner of Heat B. They taught it, they trained it a few tricks and they trained it how to bite, and it certainly had a lot of bite in its straws. A bit too much bite as it kept getting stuck on the wall half the time. <laughs> But also one of the key robots to actually give Firestorm a real amount of trouble. Mm. That is true. I mean, I, I was, this is one of the biggest tragedies. I wish this team had come back again because they had such a great r- looking robot off the bat. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people do forget that it was doing well against Bayamoth. A lot of people seem to remember Bayamoth losing for the spike as opposed to how well Pitbull was actually doing. I was upset when I saw that spike defeat Bayamoth because I wanted Bayamoth to win. But if it went to just a decision, uh, Pitbull... Would, pro- would have been the deserving winner, I would say, in, in hindsight. And then quite, ar- very quite cool. ironically, it was knocked out by the Arena Spike in its very next fight. Ironically. Indeed. I mean, it's it's weird, though, that it's called Pitbull when it's got more of a Dalmatian colour to it mm. than an actual Pitbull. Like, it, if, if anything, its face looks more like a terrapin or some kind of like snapping turtle or something. It does, doesn't it? Save me from the weed turtles! <laughs> <laughs> so, RoboCow, this appeared in the same heat, um, Heat B, uh, went out in the first round against General Carnage. Now, RoboCow is quite a sad tale, really, because it was supposed to have this big um, aesthetic-looking head that would have fitted onto the top, which looked really cool and menacing, but unfortunately, because it put the robot over the weight limit, which was quite a common occurrence in Series 3, the head had to be removed, and it broke down during the fight. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually quite funny, really, because this team also came with the spider, which obviously might get a little longer mention later, but mm. that robot was also overweight. They yes. had to, like, take bits off it. So they seemed to have a problem with having their robots being overweight for some reason. It was always the aesthetics they probably focused on first, rather than the function, I suppose. I mean, looking at the design they were going into for Series 4, I do like the design of Son of RoboCow that they were mm. considering, but obviously didn't get rid, didn't, get, didn't qualify. It's not, it looks a lot better than RoboCow itself, which just, in minus the head, it is just a box with spikes. With a wooden tail on the back. Yeah, which got rammed off by Matilda, from what I remember. Mm. Though all things considered, it did go up against what you could say is a very capable opponent in General Carnage. Like, yep. General Carnage kind of showed off in its fight. Yeah. They got a nice uh, shot with the sparks with all the um, with the angle grinders. That's probably the best shot the angle grinders have ever had. I would agree. Great shot. So now, one more robot that came from Heat B, Shark Attack, a shark-themed robot, which was defeated by Behemoth in the first round. Basically, it had the same sort of weapon aesthetic as Behemoth, but obviously considerably inferior. Yeah, I mean, the fight was so quick with Behemoth that they had to, like, use the same shot from different angles twice just to fill up any time. Because all that happens, they bumped into it and then just got flipped over. 
They must have the speciality of just ending the battle very quickly during Series Three in the first World Championship. I would say. Yeah, it was it was much more um, a bit more merciless in that in degree in Series Three. It was uh, mm. it was it was out to win, given the fact they had a much better design yeah. than Series Two. It was very yeah. much strictly business and, for Bearmoth. Yeah. And considering just how well General Carnage performed in its first round battle, Bearmoth kind of walked over it in round two. Oh, that is also true, yeah. <laughs> but, no, nah, Shark Attack itself, I just forget it exists sometimes. Yeah, we, mo- we, remember their other- we remember their other robot a lot more, don't we? Oh, Banshee. <laughs> I know yeah. um, Anson is a particular fan of Banshee. I mean, at first, I like it as well, just for how absurd and how funny it got taken out, but... I mean, I mean, shouldn't manage to make the underside of Shark Attack like it was tinfoil. It just yeah. ripped into it. Like there's no resistance from the axe. I was, and it, I was going to say, and even then, the axe wasn't really swinging at full power either. It was just kind of meandering over, but it was still going through. Mm. But all things considered, it was built by the Scouts, and they put together a really good-looking machine. Yes, so not 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 bad for a first time build, really. It's just that it was up against such a strong opponent. Yeah, there's a few robots in Series Three on this particular list, list that have that issue. Yeah, Max Damage, which came in Heat C, did not have a particularly strong opponent in Agent Orange. But the team, however, made the biggest mistake of forgetting to switch the robot on. Yeah, it's a bit of a problem. I mean, your robot working is often a good thing. And I'm starting to think that Max Damage was one of the robots that kind of um, move, made the movement into Series 4 onwards, where they drove the robots into the arena. Obviously, it wasn't shown in Series 4, but they, they did that more often. Check they were working or not, because otherwise you don't want a situation like this where the robot's just not moving. And it's like, oh, I forgot to turn it on. Well, that's the battle. Exactly. So you never like it when um, the battle starts and only one of the robots is moving. Very... Well, in my opinion, I, I think they could have done it where they could have just restarted the fight and just let it move. Like, if they realized it wasn't wor- moving, they could have gone, oh, can we just restart for a sec? Like, they did it with, um, oh, there's another robot they did it with later on. Like, Havoc in Series 2, where they almost didn't do the gauntlet. They let it restart, turn it on, and then it was fine. I mean, I was happy for Agent Orange to go through, but I'd rather it's, um, it's important to put up a better fight, you know? Yeah, it, I mean, I, I can't even really call this a fight. It was literally just one robot went into another robot and then just nudged it into the pit. And that was as far as it went. Yeah. Another robot from Heat C with the animal theme, and one that I actually quite like, is Agrobot. It looks like some kind of angry badger. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Series 3 version of Agrobot, I always forget how bulky this one was. It's enormous. Because yeah, every other version since, where they really downsized it, but the first one is it, like a shed. Yeah, I mean, it's got this big spike cannon on the back, and they use a similar weapon setup for the following series. But yeah, that's the thing. You see, your first robot, you always tend to build it a lot bigger than you really it really needs to be. Because um, my first beetle weight was bigger than it really needed to be, so I slimmed down my designs in the future. So that's what they kind of did with Agrobot for series four and then into series five. Although I don't think it looked so good the further it went into the series. I was going to say, I think despite how over over large the Series Three version was, I think it's the best looking Agrobot. It is the best looking Agrobot. It's got the. It's just. It just. It's just something about it that's um. Really it had worked. some beautiful artwork going on with it, especially mm. like um, like the little close up they got of the little wedge tongue they've got. That's like that's ridiculously well detailed for something that's going to scrape along the floor and just get completely scratched up. I love it when they put a lot of um, effort into their painting job and everything. It's a much nicer. It's because I because I, I hand paint my robots as well, but these guys obviously invested a lot of um, time in it and everything. So kudos to them. That is beautiful. Yeah, but I like how the teams so they got more and more punk as they went through the series. Like in yeah. series three and four, they're pretty normal. Then like series seven, they're in like studs and leather. <laughs> and I'm mean, like, I just I just love how they work out until they made a little mini biker gang out of themselves. That's love pretty it. cool. They look like bikers as well. <laughs> Which is funny because the Smitty team were bikers, and yet they never really dressed like them. I guess they wanted to avoid the stereotype, but Robot Wars is all about having fun and um, cosplaying to some extent as well, I suppose. Maybe yeah, they're... it was always there. Was there was there was, there was, there was like a fun, ne, despite how that robot never really did any better in Series Three. The team always did seem like a bit a lot of fun, so I was enjoyed oh. watching them. It's all theatre, and honestly, some of these robot designs are theatre, which is what yeah. makes them so fun. I mean, I've, I've kind of been theatre myself. Like, when I took Volpe to battle in the borough, I wore a fox hoodie, and um, that was quite fun. 
I mean, also, can we forget this robot is about about one point seven meters tall? This thing is this thing is tall. Like it's already really it's almost a meter long, but damn, is it massive? Yeah, point seven meters tall. That sounds almost too tall. Well, <laughs> speaking of massive, let's go the opposite way and go for one of the lightest, if not the lightest, entries in the main competition series three: Shell Shock, based on a tortoise. Also, we have to clarify, this is the first of two shell shocks we'll be talking about tonight, so there's a yeah. great naming scheme there in retrospect. But yeah, this thing's light. I mean, although de- design-wise, absolutely adore it. I love how much yeah. ca- character it has. They have the limbs and the head of the turtle that can go able to retract in and out of the shell, which is quite neat. As pretty as it is, how much weight do you think they... they... Well, I mean, Robot was really light, but how much weight do you think went into just that mechanism? Probably most of it, because the shell was only made of 2 millimeter steel, apparently. And the axe is pretty flimsy looking. It looks like just a piece of metal. It's like an axe shape, as opposed to like a proper axe. Didn't look very strong, did it? It, it fell off. Like after, I can't remember how it... I can't, it, just, it started like twisting sideways throughout the fight, and then eventually it just sort of fell off entirely. And then the snail decoration fell off um, because of Sir, courtesy of Sir Killalot. I'm just very sad they never had the little tortoise head sticking out at any point. Mm. Natural fight. I mean, that was it in the pits, and it's like official shots, but you never saw it in the fight, which is a bit of a shame. But I guess it would have been injured like the, sh- like, like the snail, I suppose. Yeah, pretty much. Um, Crocodilotron appearing in Heat E. This was a very, very good looking robot, very fine looking crocodile themed robot, which was. Got a bit of an unlucky draw in the first round against the future UK two-time UK champion. Yeah, it was such an unlucky draw. It was ter- it was an awful draw for it because A, that robot looked utterly brilliant, and B, hmm. I was actually really happy to see that the robot still exists to some extent. It- I think some pictures, recent pictures of it have turned up, haven't they? Yes, they. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit rusted, but you can still tell the real tell the robot. Pretty well. It still looks really like it's like it was originally. It's it's nice to see it's still around in some yeah. form. Use its jaws as was typical of any crocodile themed robot uh, to bite onto the opponent. Although we never really got to see that in action, of course. You could see it's a bit cumbersome otherwise, but it looked pretty strong as well. It's honestly a massive shame that this robot never got to um never got to show itself off because it actually has a decently sized jaw on it. Like yeah, it could grab a decent amount of robots, and also the fact it's so massive. Makes yeah. it quite hard for the robots to really get a hold of it. So I can see we're mm. doing okay, but yeah, go- going against the future two times champion is not going to be a good start for it. Mm. We'll give an honorable mention to Sonic as well, which um, appears in the same episode, which kind of bear the passing resemblance to Sonic the Hedgehog. And I forgot to mention Bumblebot earlier as well, actually, which was a Bumblebee themed robot. But well, we don't really like Bumblebot because it was useless. <laughs> it was overcompensating for something with that axe, let's just say yeah. that. Alligator, which came later on, that's another honourable mention because it um, has an alligator sort of name and an alligator like soft toy stuck on the top. That came in Heat H, which was Hypnodisc Seat. The ridges on the top were pretty good for getting robots stuck on top of as well, like uh, Corporal Punishment. Yeah, that was a great fight, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely fantastic. Anyway, moving on. Um, Bulldog Breed appeared in Heat G, um, starting off with, and, well... On the outset, a colourful machine, a great concept, using circular saws for the teeth at the front. But the robot itself didn't really move very much in its first round battle, did it, against uh, Robopig, another animal-themed robot. Two birds of one stone, I suppose, in a weird way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Bulldog Breeds, for, it's sort of like um, Smidzi's first appearance, where it made like no impression in Series 3. Like It, it looks nice. I mean, it can't retain the same look in Series 4, but with a flipper, but yeah, yeah. It, it was in series three was infamous for having really bad radio issues. Like loads of robots just barely moved or got stuck on, yeah. you know, driving forward, drive or stuttering, and you could tell yeah. Bulldog was having major issues driving alone. Yeah, Griffin had signal problems as well in the further heats I remember, and that resulted in one of the shortest battles. But we'll get to that later on when we discuss Cerberus. Bulldog Breed had um, went from saws to the flipper in series four, which seemed to work a bit better for us. And then they beefed up the flipper for Extreme and Series 5 onwards, and soon became a well-respected competitor. Yeah, it was very satisfying to see Bulldog Breed finally get out of the heat in Series uh, series 7. Yes, it, it had to face Hypnodisc twice. Yeah. 
which is I, I, I don't know how much more unlucky you can get having to face them yeah. twice in two consecutive series. I know, because it's just, it's just one of those things, isn't it? It was also because of their damage. They, they had to forfeit their place in the uh, Annihilator as well. Yeah, the, the, same, dominating thing, the same thing happened to Atomic as well, which I was really quite upset about. But Atomic got, yeah. its, got its stay in Series 7 as well, which was good. Hmm. Um, series, 7, series 7 was really good for robots that like needed like just you know a little bit more a, a, mm-hmm. a bit of a less open field, like you know, losing Razor, Chaos Two, and Hitman Disc, and having more chance to do their own thing. Yeah. Um, so and the, we were talking about Robo Pig earlier because that was the robot that faced Bulldog Breed in round one. Robo Pig being the winner. I like Robo Pig. It's got a cute concept. The team are fun. The kid that's on the team takes losing very well when he's against Napalm in round two, and I just love that he, the Robo Pig just keeps smiling through it all and keeps moving even when it's stranded on its hind legs in the second round. Yeah, I mean, we got to talk about that weapon, though. Mm. I mean, I, I get what the concept was. It's like Toe Cutter's weapon, but vertical. Yeah, and it's such like a, it looks like, like such a very flimsy... I mean, I don't know how heavy the actual weapon was, but it just looked like a toothpick from on camera. It's like a little, like, it's like a little butter knife that just sticks out the front. Yeah, I, I was... I mean, obviously, I know it's not meant to be taken too serious. I mean, the robot's called yeah. Robo Pig, but... Yeah. Quite it's a, a very weedy weapon. Quite a slow robot as well, made out of a plastic barrel, but looks quite chunky as well. But I, I, it left a wee bit of an impression on me because when Robo Pig got toasted, Sir Killlock caught fire as well, which is quite funny. <laughs> oh yeah, of course he was. He was trying to he was trying to make some bacon and ends up getting killed himself. It's going like smoky bacon. Oh, and Killlock's on fire as well. Well, you got to admit, Robo, the way Robo, Robo Pig went out is possibly one of the funniest. Like, it's just stuck on its back for so long. And it's like, it I think maybe, maybe over, you know... It just sort of rolls over onto its back really slowly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to quote the appropriate Simpsons episode, it's still good. It's still good. It's gone. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, what well, well, Robo Pig. Uh, uh, J- JV's commentary definitely made that moment even better. Definitely. One of those standout moments from the classics that's going to be with us for a long time to come. And one last animal-themed robot that appeared in the same heat was Caterkiller, defeated by Napalm in round one on the controversial judge's decision. It's got t- The first version of Caterkiller had these tiger stripes and a tiger sort of face motif on it, which was abandoned for series four, but then they came back with the tiger stripe motif again for Cat 3 in the subsequent series. I mean, you say controversial. <laughs> um, There's not much to good really say about the battle, really, because it was just he for he for nothing too exciting. I mean, literally, the only thing that happened is that they almost got pushed into the pit. And that yeah. was it. I'd almost argue with Team Cat, because of course I returned with Cat for a lot later. Mm. The actual animal theme is on the team itself. And then moving on to the winner of Heat G, Stegosaurus, another dinosaur-themed robot, but this one much more successful. Yeah, this thing was a reserve. Which is... I was, was going to say, talk about one hell of a first impression as well. Yeah, Pull from the reserves to compete. Do we know who they replaced? I, I, I mean, we do. It's T-Rex they replaced. Which yeah. was it was just you, you see it in the background occasionally. It appeared in series seven later on as well, but it's sort of this like massive like it looks a little bit like roadblock actually, just a giant wedge with like some kind of spinning blade I think out of it. But we we only saw like background shots of it. It never actually appeared in, on camera properly. Um, mm. Which is probably it means one dinosaur themed robot plays another dinosaur themed robot, which is hilarious. The weapon that was on Stegosaurus was a simple flipping spike tail, which really was more aesthetic than anything else. The main focus was its strong pushing power. Which is quite surprising, because the original robot is supposed to have tracks, mm. um, which aren't, which can be hit or miss when it comes to traction, pun intended. Like Sometimes yeah. they can be really good, like Mortis, and other times they just have no traction at all. But yeah. it's, I think that explains... Why Stegosaurus was bad at turning? So it was. It's one issue that it was constantly would just like stutter when trying to turn round. Very, very poor at turning. But at least its other its points tended not to be quick enough to be able to react to it. If you can imagine what Stegosaurus would have been like with that kind of speed with tracks, it would have been unstoppable. Nothing would have been able to come up against it. Mm. I mean, it's funny in its first fight, Orax Revenge was considered the favorite just for the fact they're in the last series, and then. Mm. They could do nothing to them. They just had no pushing power. The axe was just bonking off them, not really doing anything. 
and then just got shoved straight into the pit and then Henry got thrashed like it, it deserved to be because honestly it shouldn't have been hard work but <laughs> I don't think hard work would have beaten Steg either though oh no I don't I, I agree with hmm. that but I just kind of like seeing no, a I, I totally agree Henry, Henry beating hard work was one of the most infuriating decisions of the whole series I would say and then they just thrashed the already um, thrashed napalm, which was napalm. Yeah. It was, it, in fact, it's just napalm. In fact, it was the exact same napalm from the last series, but just slightly touched up. It still had some of its uh, damage from its mortis fight. Still I just think I do distinctly remember when I was young when I actually first watched that heat when it was first airing. Uh, that might that fight actually sticks my memory quite strongly because uh, I, it was kind of at that point where I kind of got the impression that. The game is kind of changing here. It was the first time that we were literally seeing a robot being beaten to beaten to pieces. It was painful to watch, but also very entertaining. And I'm sure Rara was crying <laughs> watching that. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. more, a more tentative fight in the semi-finals against Gravedigger. That was a close was. fight. That I, that I, I, I there, there could be an argument made for Stegosaurus losing that, but I do agree with the decision. Mm-hmm. But it was very close. I mean, if Matilda hadn't randomly interfered, they could have flipped them over entirely. Right. And that would have been that. Yeah, and uh, I'm trying to remember who they fought in the second part of the semi-final. Beast oh, of Bobman. That was it, Beast of Bobman. Yeah, they they they, they hit him so hard that the one of the eyes permanently got stuck closed. Mm. Beast of Bodman, you could argue is an animal themed robot as well, but it was just a bit too vague. It was like some mythical sort of thing. Yeah, it's just like a furry wedge. That's what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> and then Steg puts up a fight against Hypnodisc, but eventually the, it can't stand up to the damage that's being dished out on its side armor and everything. It was a valiant attempt, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's actually a bit of a shame, though. We, since they were so battered, they couldn't have a um, third place playoff fight. So the Osmanli got the fourth place as a result. Yeah. Steg 2 comes back, same, very similar shape, but it's now polycarb, because all series 4 machines tended to use polycarb, and they've gone for a proper flipper this time on the back, although it's still a bit of a curious choice to have it at the back there. And yeah, that was, was the one thing. It was no joke mm. of a flipper either. Mm, it did very well uh, in the first round, um, flipping over Kronos. It flipped over Iron Ore as well in round 2, and Mortis in round 3, before eventually going out to Chaos 2 in the semi-final round 1. Um... Yeah, I mean, good, good. one thing I will say, though, in its very first fight, Crusader almost killed it. <laughs> like, yeah. almost got it over in the fir- in like, the very first hit, they instantly went straight for them. And then they got stuck on the mm. side, and I think they got self righted by one of the house robots. But it was just like... I, I, just just yeah. imagine the scenes. Like, Steg, you know, Steg, Steg 2, you know, the high seeding, and it <laughs> it gets flipped over by Crusader 2, a robot that fell into the pit in the pinball. I was just mental. But no, it wasn't meant to be. <laughs> Comes back. They come back with a new robot in series five and extreme three stags to heaven. It returns to the green dinosaur aesthetic, probably for the better, I would say. Although the weapon argu- is definitely not as effective. And well, yeah, this was because Rob he he's I believe I think he I think that's his name. He yeah. he left, which was he was like the big driving force of the first two robots. So they had yeah. plans for the robot, but never really had the proper technical expertise as much as him, so it kind of ends up as like a sort of invertible spinning disc robot, which it's it's one of the most unfortunate downgrades of a robot ever, given how much promising the flipper was in Seg 2, and you get a mm. more average beats, robot. Beats Legs 11, as I think JP called it, on a judge's decision in round one. Um, that was quite... Um, that would have been quite an un- unpleasant way to go out if... Um, Eleven got put through there. Yeah, they just they just got stuck. Like it just got entangled in all the wires in the, and the in the hydraulic cables. <laughs> yeah, and this is it, it's so painful. They do reach the heat final though, which is quite a respectable um, place to end, end end really, I suppose. Yeah, it was it was a bit. I would say very lucky that they beat Tetanus. Mm. Now Tetanus just sort of like died. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But then they they got fully thrashed by Bigger Brother though, which unfortunately they never got flipped out of the arena, which was a bit of a shame. Yeah. And so yeah, we'll move on to the next robot after that, Terror Pin. This was from uh, Beast of Bodmin's Seat, and Philippa really loved this robot. I love it too. It's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's cute. And it's a tragedy this robot didn't make it into series four, but yet Humphrey did. But you know, whatever. <laughs> Big issues aside. Um. 
this robot, um, I, I mentioned this before we're recording, but this has my favorite useless fact ever of any robot, is that Terrapin is an anagram of Repteron from Series 4. Uh, oh, shut it's, up. It's the, it seriously is. And it's on, I think it's on the wiki. I think that's where I found it. Yeah, it, it was, was actually... Hmm. It wasn't the same team, was it? No, not the same team, but literally an anagram of each other. Um, somebody else... Somebody found this out, and yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and also, I know they're not a different team. Also, they're also a different team because obviously both they they failed, failed to qualify for Series Four, but Reptile made made it in, which is shocking to me. But uh, given Terrapin gets past, Terrapin gets past first and Getrix in round one, and then is taken out by Invertebrat in round two. That was such a such an out there win. Like Verse and Getrix had a mm-hmm. much better design than had in Series Two. It's a lot chunkier, and also the flip looked a bit better on it, and it looked. More solid, and Terrapin's this kind of jokey dome robot, and then it just gets the big push. That's all it takes sometimes, because well, remember Dieto, that managed to get the big push against Tornado later on. Yeah, that is true. I mean, it's just unfortunate the second opponent was a robot they literally had no counter to. Like, there's nothing they can do. Here we're moving on to another uh, round a robot that um, unfortunately went out in round one, Eric. Um, which has got this strange green crocodile dinosaur sort of shape to it. I was going to say, what exactly is Eric's theme? I mm. get crocodile out of it. That's the only thing I can yeah. think of. The punk hairstyle. I'll tell you something which is really cool about Eric, which I didn't yes. realise, is that Eric's technology, which actually fire the jaws, is actually kind of a predecessor to what we see nowadays in Hydra. Mm. Oh, really? Just because Eric's, if you notice Eric's flipper, it's actually quite quick, but it is hydraulic. That's down to it having an, a hydraulic accumulator inside it, which is exactly how Hydra works. Because Hydra kind of takes it to a logical extreme and it, you know, fires with a lot more force. But Eric, yeah, exactly the same, it has a accumulator in there, which means it can actually flip things up rather quickly for a, for a hydraulic system anyway. It goes out in round one against King Buxton, although King B very nearly put itself down the pit. And one of the most interesting manoeuvres around the pit I think I've ever seen. Yeah. Comes back in Series 4 a bit better. It reaches the Heat Finals. Yeah, it was it was a worthy robot for the time, I think, Eric. It was... Mm. And obviously, by Series 4, robots were getting a little bit stronger than it already, but it was still impressive. Like, I mean, it did take on Small Talk pretty well. It did well in its first fight. You know, it was always in the action. And it got a few mm-hmm. good flips on a Splinter, but it's kind of unfortunate that this robot's kind of been overshadowed by its kind of weird meme status it has now, which I think yeah. ruins it a little bit, because I like the robot by itself, and I think it's a fine, nice-looking robot. It's just that the amount of times I've I mentioned it, if I say I, I like Eric, and someone will think, oh, I'm, I must be because of the memes. I'm like, no, I just think Eric's a nice little robot, but, you know, just it was at RoboNerd as well. Ah, yes, it did, yeah. It's, um, it, it tried to be on the live circuit for a little bit. Um, and then Gabriel yeah. decided, nope. Nope, just going to smash the hell out of it, which is, it was satisfying to watch, if a little bit sad. Next one, Evil Weevil. Now, we mentioned Kevin Pritchard earlier as part of the Panic Attack team. He splits off from the team and essentially goes solo and brings in a couple of um, kids from the school that he, t- he taught at to build a very Panic Attack-esque robot with lifting spikes at the front. Um, Evil Weevil this time with a fiberglass body shell. It's the only robot that appears in the robotic soccer tr- events that also competes in the main competition. I, I don't mind Evil Weevil. It's, I don't know, it's one of those robots that I remember but I don't remember caring about it, which I feel a bit bad saying. It's not a bad robot. I mean, by Series 3 standards, it was decent. You know, I mean, it essentially was another version of Panic Attack in, a, in some ways, like more, yeah. more close to the original one. But a little bit more design. Apart from Wild Willy, it was probably the strongest robot in its own heat, which doesn't really no, say much. Heat L was a very weak heat overall. I mean, yeah. if it's, um, you say it was also in the, it was in the robotic soccer, but it didn't score a single goal and somehow still managed to win. It, it won that, and it, yeah, it didn't win a single goal in its qualifying battle. And then in the final with the other four robots, it didn't score a goal either. It somehow just didn't break. Was the only one that didn't break down yeah. or something like that. It was a fluke, to say the least. In this. But one thing that really amazed me about Evil Weevil was just how well it actually stood up to Hypnodisc in its semi-final. I mean, considering it was fiberglass and Kevlar, 
Oh, Kevlar, right. Yeah, Kevlar with uh, Velcro strips on the back to um, try and gum mm. up spinning weaponry. And, um, I mean, yeah. obviously it didn't gum up a disc at all, but it stood up to it surprisingly well, especially considering that it was just Kevlar. Yeah, it, it yeah. just took a few, like, tiny little strips off it. Like, the robot was completely intact for the most part. It just, obviously, its internals got completely ripped up in like, battered up by uh, the, all the shaking of it. It's all the shock damage and everything. Um, comes back in Series 4 with a mu It's a bit of a downgrade, let's be honest. The lifting spikes have been replaced with a rather ineffective-looking axe. And probably worse still, the good paint job it had in Series 3, it's now completely sprayed gold, which really doesn't look quite as good. Yeah, it looks like it's kind of like rusted a bit, like it left yeah. out for a bit. But it, I mean, the fact they also didn't charge the battery, didn't use a battery that was fully charged, which was sad. It's schoolboy, but also it was it was pretty much its heat to win. It was because the only other seeded robot in the heat was Weldor, and that also went ra out in round one, making heat uh, heat K the only heat in series four where both seeds went out in round one. Yeah, and then he left with... I mean, it's funny, actually, in its first round battle, if it had carried on working throughout the whole thing, Tiberius broke down at one point. Like, it got stuck in like in a mm. circle or something. Like, the original Tiberius was not very reliable, and it just got... Mm. And Mousetrap somehow survived. So it would have been a Mousetrap and Evil Wheel going through, and it would have. Mousetrap was not a really a beacon of... Like, a poster child of... Um reliability either, but Mousetrap goes on to be the winner of the heat eventually. Yeah, I mean, it definitely showed that really there's only one really good robot on their heat when Mousetrap... I mean, I like Mousetrap, but Mousetrap winning a whole heat is definitely a sign of it's not the best, but like a Trident in Series 3. Oh, it's not a terrible mm -hmm. robot, but the quality was lower in comparison. Yeah. Not an animal-themed robot, but it does have mouse in the title. <laughs> yes, I think it counts, <laughs> in some ways. So moving on to the next heat, you had two animal themed robots, Dundee, the first one, another crocodile themed robot in a similar vein to Crocodilatron, with it, which also had an unlucky draw as it was against Cassius 2, the robot that beat this team in the previous wars when they had Loco. Dundee looked fantastic though, didn't it? Hmm. Yeah. Crocodile Dundee is where the name inspiration comes from. I, I like teams like this who can come in with one robot and then they can make a completely different design. And apart from the team being the same, you would never tell. The only thing that's similar is the sort of barrel shape of the robot, but it's, a, it's an infinitely better, better design they've gone for there. Yeah, because Loco was okay, but not that effective. But it was it has much more personality to it. Yeah, and eventually Cassius 2 flips over lack of a self writing mechanism that's done the out. They could have gone a lot further, depending on the opponents that they faced. Yeah, because I don't think Pussycat could have done that much to them, given that this is Series 3 yeah. Pussycat, which is definitely a lot Hard. The, the driving wasn't as or, there yet. Yeah. Or Scott's revenge, even. Yeah, because that thing was very reliable in Series Three. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Um, moving on, Thermidor also appeared in the same heat. Um, took out Plunderstorm in round one, if for no other reason than the fact that Plunderstorm died after a few seconds. Well, even it was. I was going to say there. taken out is a bit of a strong word for. Yes. Yes. Well, taken out with qu uh, quotation marks, shall we say? I like that the head of the original was like a cycling helmet. It was. it was. It was. As far as animal aesthetics go, this robot is great. You've got the lobster claws at the front, and at the back you've got, well, you had a circular saw at the back on the original robot, but it was very much shaped like a lobster, with a couple of great big mini metro wheels sticking out. Yeah, it's, it's funny how overshadowed it is by its, by its sequel. A bit like Chaos in a lot of ways as well, but it still it retains a lot of the design, which I still think it's very rare for like sequel robots to kind of like keep the design aesthetic almost the same, but just change the weapon. And there was never a Thermidor three; they just kept calling it Thermidor two, despite making considerable changes to it each and every time. Like they, they took the back end off to make it a bit more um, effective, and they also changed the paint job and the face when they came back for the reboot. I keep forgetting they came back for the reboot in the series. It's like Crustacean; you just sort of forget it came back at one point and then just lasted yeah. as long as it started. We'll be covering that robot a lot later on, definitely. Mm, definitely, but certainly. Thermidor, Thermidor went out in round two to Scutter's Revenge. It's the series where it really shines is Series 4, where it goes on to win its seats, I believe. An impressive fashion, too. Mm. It was... I, it, it, that heat was also a bit of a tragic one for me as well, just because I love Gravedigger and the Series 4 version, and it's such a shame the flipper didn't work. 
Yeah, uh, that was a beautiful. It was, but Thermidor, honestly, apart from Gravedigger, I would say it was actually probably the best robot in the heat. Um, mm. Given the fact that in the second fight, you also have things like Dreadnought and Dark Destroyer 2. It wasn't a very yeah. stacked heat in comparison, but it was, it was such a glow up. Like, it looks so much cooler. Then it takes out Chronic the Wedgehog, which we'll also talk about a bit later as it debuts in Series 4. It didn't just take it out, it ripped its face off. <laughs> Yeah, Pussycat is the robot it then comes um, against in the uh, semi-final round one. Now, Pussycat, of course, we could have mentioned in the same heat, but it, apart from the fact it always lands on its feet, it doesn't really have much of an animal aesthetic, although they do make an effort with the lovely art that was done by Anne Gribble for the following seasons. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, Thermidor, as some people might know, has a curse on it, whereby mm. it only gets through to the semi-finals when Philippa Forrester is not there. Um, and Bigger right. Brother have the opposite problem, where they, they need Philip Forrester to be there to get to the semi-finals. In fact, because in Series 5, they lose in the first round against Price Fighter Mach 2, because event- because Price Fighter flips them over so many times, eventually they run out of gas and can't self right I, no, I, th- I believe they just bro- they broke down against Price Fighter. They did eventually, yeah, but they ran out of gas first, so they were inverted and the weapon was compromised. Yeah, because... For some reason, in Series Four, Thermidor was really reliable. Like it was, you know, it managed to get to a judge decision against, you know, um, mm. Pussycat after taking a decent amount of hits from it. In Series Five, Six, and Seven, it would always lose to like very minor things, like it would get flipped over enough, or it would get hit by one hit here by Typhoon or something. And Price Fighter had really upped its game, though. To be fair, by that point, and in the Sixth Wars, they were against well, Thirteen Black, Stinger, and Chompalot. Um, quite competitive. I don't know how the um. They went out in that one now because that was quite a long time. Yeah, ago. drove into the pit. I think. I think they went. Into it. Yeah, they did reach the semi-finals again though in series seven. Um, after uh, only to get taken out by Typhoon Two. Hmm. They are also actually the first robot to knock two uh, to Uta two robots in the same fight. They did it in extreme with the Behemoth and Stinger. <laughs> yeah, which was such a dominant performance, and I think they go out in the first round of the Iron of Nihilator. So showing their very lopsided reliability once again, where they can perform when they want to, but then other times it just doesn't. And in Series 8, they encounter Chompalot again in the group battle where they are defeated. Yeah, I mean, it was actually, uh, they took a massive hit from Shunt, like, to the wheel, and that kind of stopped yeah. them from moving, like, on one side for ages, and eventually they got hit by uh, Iron Side 3, and this is this, hor- this is this image of it on the wiki, where it's just one of its wheels, just com- both its wheels are bent, and it's leaking gas, and it just doesn't look, it doesn't look healthy anymore. Don't bring wheels into the arena. <laughs> JP said that, and it's still true. It is. Um, moving on, Cerberus. Um, this one, basically, based on the Hellhound, the, de- the demonic Hellhound, if you like, but the paint job in Series 3 and the aesthetic is gorgeous. It's just so, so beautiful. The way the colours are all um, just kind of in- blend in with one another. It's so shiny. It was definitely built to look good. Beauty kills the beast. Yeah, it was. It's, this is definitely a robot that favored design aesthetic over you know actual functionality but to its credit it wasn't a bad robot it was um and got one of the quickest KOs of the series against Griffin and mm. um they put up a decent fight against well I say put up a decent fight against Kilohertz they survived a hit from Kilohertz before they decided to go into the pit for some reason. John Reed being John Reed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it should have been to go. And then uh, Thing 2 took them out in the final. There was no doubt that Thing 2 was going to defeat them, but even then... Well, probably a flipping, quite a good flip as well. Just kind of tickling the tummy as uh, JP inquired, and then he just flipped over. But can we just say that the Series 4 version... Man, what a, what a downgrade. It doesn't look so nice, does it? It looks so much grungier, and it doesn't help that the head had to be removed because the robot was overweight. Yeah, and after all that build-up, obviously, you know, they had to, you know, with also the fight and the fact that they had to replace um, Onslaught with the reserve VMAX, and they get yeah. taken out by the reserve. V-Max. Yeah. So Cerberus suffers the same fate as RoboCow, loses its head, loses in round one, and it doesn't come back for a future series, except for Robot Wars Extreme, where it's now a shiny silver. So it's an improvement from Series 4, but I still think Series 3 version looks nicer. Yeah, the Series 3 version was the peak of its design. It was the peak. peak for us. Oh, um, so it failed to qualify for two series as well, which is a bit of a shame. Yeah. Series 3 really has been the barnyard of um, Robot Wars, shall we say, because we've covered quite a lot of robots in this series alone, more so than any of the other series that we've done and to come. 
Only two left to discuss now. Crash and Masha, which went out in round one against Firestorm, didn't take long to defeat at all. But the shark aesthetic on it is pretty nice, though. I mean, again, great aesthetics. It just happened to be mm. just pretty much just skill shotted by a pretty fantastic opponent, really. It reminds me a bit of Sharks of Trachean in Bugglebots, of course, because that has got a great aesthetic to it as well. But it's also it also lasted just as that. long. Yeah, against a fantastic opponent in the shape of Wario. I mean, one thing, I think this is one of my favourite like first round those is just aesthetic alone. Yeah. But it's also the hardest I've ever laughed. It's probably one of those like, top 10 yeah. Robot Wars classic series moments I've watched over and over. It's just watching it flail over after a Firestorm. It's a it pretty hard. The thing that gets me is the fact that Firestorm never even used the weapon. That was all power from the wedge. Yeah. Yeah, and it just toppled over, and it's like he saw got caught in its um head of it, and it started like spewing smoke slightly, and yeah, um, it's what it makes one hell of a way for Firestorm to make a first impression. It shows they're really not mucking about. Yeah, and I have no idea how Dead Metal managed to make the the like the caster wheel on the back just fly off after hitting <laughs> it like a few times. I don't know what physics allows that to happen. Just wait. But the same physics that cost the baton its wheel in an earlier heat. I, I know, it was using RA2 physics, I think that's what yeah. it was doing. Uh, or, Rob, or rather, Robot Wars, um, what's its name, um, from on the PS2 or Xbox? Oh, Robot Extreme Wars. Destruction. Rumors of Destruction. Because, your weapon, because I remember my first battle, I go in there and my pickaxe is broken off straight away. Yeah, I mean, both Arenas of Destruction and Extreme Destruction had... I think Extreme Destruction was worse because the house robots would go flying everywhere. Yeah, but let's not talk about Metal Mayhem, of course. Crash and Asha appears in Metal Mayhem and looks nothing like the robot that, um, the, the real robot. It's a very strange addition to put in a game. Like, I know Ultor didn't make it in. I think no, but Purple Predator's also in there. Predator Predator's in it, um, Ultor's in it, um, Terminal Ferocity, Dundee's in it, of course, and Thermidor as well. Yeah, they must like animals, I guess. Yeah. Just a lot of questionable decisions about that game. I f I still feel betrayed by the magazine that recommended that game because they gave such they gave such nice positive reviews of pretty much everything. I feel I feel I still feel a bit angry about I that. I think it wasn't a good game then. It was a no. It was a it was G Club magazine for the Game Boy. I was given a free trial of it, and they basically when I saw they gave a five star review for Rugrats in Paris, I realized I'd definitely been called. <laughs> <laughs> They gave a four star. They gave a four star review for Robot Wars, and I thought, "Hey, it must be good." Then it wasn't. No, that's 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 when you realize that the world is not what you thought it was. The last robot to cover in series three, we got there eventually. Rattus Rattus, which uh, they claim was spreading the bubonic plague many centuries ago, and now it's here in Robot Wars. And the robot originally was going to be two and a half meters long, which would have made it one of the longest robots ever. But they couldn't fit it into the car, so they had to cut it in half. And it was still the longest robot in the heat by quite some way. Yeah, I mean, this robot is pretty fun, admittedly. I do kind of like the idea they went for, and they, went, they fully invested in the uh, bubonic plague and oh yeah, uh, look of it. Um, another, uh, this, and I had a useless fact from Terrapin. I've also got another useless fact that comes per courtesy of the wiki, is that yeah. for some reason, it's probably one of the strangest mistakes I've ever seen in Robot Wars, the stat screen for the team mm. was also used for a prize yeah. fighter. Yeah, and quite the stat screen had a lot of questionable st statistics on it and everything, even at the best of times in the earlier seasons. But this is just plain careless. It's, weird. it's just the team members. Like the rest of the robot for prize fighter yeah. is there, but just the team members are missing. I thought you said Terrapin. I know for a prize fighter. Sorry, for, um, for, for prize fighter. Prize fighter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, it's late. <laughs> But it's Rattus Rattus. They, they go up against um, they go up against Smidzy in round one. Smidzy probably would have beaten it if it weren't for its signal problems. But Rattus Rattus is no slouch. It moves pretty quickly for its size, and it seemed so... to kind of self destruct a little bit as well. Mm, because in round two, it barely gets going. It is moving at the, just before the battle starts, and then it dies when uh, the bell rip goes. If you know what I mean. Yeah, I think it was it self destructed by running ramming into like um. The, into the house row where I was hol holding it ran into dead metal when I was holding Smidzy. But then for some reason they decided to drive onto the flame pit with all the motors like that, that probably took them out, I think, from the rest of the fight. Was uh Or maybe it was just the bubonic plague. Yeah, possibly it caught up with it after all these years. Uh, yeah. But 
The funniest thing about this robot, though, is the fact they have these two giant spikes on it, and yet the tail stick, the the, uh, the the nose sticks out further than the spikes, which makes them completely useless. So, out of all the robots in ser- that we are covering today, the Series Three had the most by far, and it definitely feels like it. Um, but then, of course, a lot of them came back for future seasons. Before we move on to Series Four, we'll give a mention to Tentamushi, which competed in the Series Three middleweight melee. And it was a five-way melee. Tentamushi appears to look a bit like a ladybird. That's the, d- the basis of the design. Um, driven by Lisa Winter, who would later go on to be a judge in BattleBots, having already been a competitor in BattleBots around the same time. Yeah, I mean, this was the fight where they just went to draw. Because <laughs> we can't be asked deciding who the winner is. Uh, I guess we'll make it a draw, I suppose. But no, but obviously this was the... Um... They used this in, in BattleBots, and also yeah, they also had Mega Tento in the re, in the in the more modern series, I believe. Tento Mushi um, actually a lightweight robot, but the producers in Robot Wars incorrectly referred to gave it a fifty-two kilo weight just so they could say it was a middleweight. Yeah, that's a bit odd. I mean, I I I do like the idea of Tento Mushi. Like it's kind of this giant robot that just clamps down and just has this little saw inside it. Yeah, shot um, control aerial. Yeah, I did. I think I th- oh, was that an aerial? Or was that just a bit of decoration that got kicked off? I can't. Remember. I'm not sure what what it was exactly. Oh, the um, if you're talking about what came off of Tentamushi, it was just um, it was the decorative antenna off yeah. the front. It lost both of them in BattleBots, and it was totally fine. Oh yeah. Yes. Um, it was its battle against. It had a battle against Akil that was shown afterwards, where it won. But believe it or not, that battle was actually recorded before the middleweight melee, where they were declared joint winners. Yeah, because they had that for the um, international league series three. Because face it, that 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 episode already needed some kind of uh, filler because it wasn't wasn't much going on in half the fights. I guess they had to put I something mean, in there. They already had. I mean, it ended up pretty tidily, really, because, I mean, they'd framed the whole thing of it being a draw, and then you kind of got some closure with that fight, even if they hadn't meant it that way. But Yeah, I mean, I still th- I think draws are a stupid thing to have in, in Robot Wars anyway. It was like that with that walk battle between Mammoth and Anarachnid. I mean, Anarachnid was obviously the more mobile one, but both robots were awful anyway. <laughs> uh, the walk battles in general were awful, so we won't really talk about that. Yeah, I mean, it was fun watching Tentamushi go around, and the best bit was definitely when Shunt just squished the entire robot at one stage against the wall, and it just bent into itself. It just bounced back again, because it's made of, like, plastic or something. Can I, can I just make a passing mention to Hard Cheese as well? The, uh... Yes. Well, what do you call that? A, a rat theme robot, or a cheese theme Well, cheese theme robot, I guess. It has but... rat mascots. Yes. It did indeed. Uh, so now we're moving on to series four with the robot themes, uh, the animal themed robots. And of course, we're starting with a robot that scored the best goal in football and did, then did absolutely nothing else for this entire run uh, Velosa Ripper. Um, it looked quite sp- It looked a bit scarier in series three, and it's a bit of a shame that it didn't get to actually compete in the main event as with most of the robotic soccer entries. But in series four, it looks a lot nicer, it looks a lot cooler. They made the eyes better. They've made they added a few more scars. It looks much more refined. Series five, they added um, active weapons to it in the form of some saws. And then in series six, they made a big bulky version that looked like it was made out of fiberglass, which I didn't really like at all, if I'm perfectly honest. Well, Voss Ripper kind of took on a, a kind of new life after um after series five, didn't it? I think it kind of got reincarnated as another machine, uh, Mega Mouse. Mighty Mouse. So, my, my Mighty Mouse, you got it. And yes. then later Mega Mouse. Yeah. We'll cover Mighty Mouse later on, obviously. But in the meantime, Velociraptor never really did have this, a great level of success, unlike its mousy successor. In its battle in Series 4, where it was against Robo Chicken, and we'll talk about that soon, and the number three seeds and first world champions, Razor. So quite an unfavorable draw there. And it looks like Robo Chicken's getting its butt handed to it. But then Voss Ripper gets crunched in the front, and that affects its steering. Yeah, I mean, Voss Ripper was never known for being a very reliable robot yeah. in most of its appearances. I mean, fair play, an extreme game beaten by something like Disco Inferno or whatever. But then it sort of just got hit one hit hit by the alien once, and it just sort of all died completely. 
it's not very well shock absorbed. It is interesting because Velociraptor is one of the very few robots in Robot Wars which actually adopts car steering. Uh, the only other ones being Kilohertz, and I think that might be about it, at least as far as that comes to my memory. It was on Onslaught as well, I think, had it. True. But yeah, it was very unique for the time. I mean, given it's, it's probably one of the less obvious car steering robots, but I mean, I, it definitely got a lot better with. Um, it's weird as soon as it turned into its uh, successor in Series Six, it did so much better. And then obviously the they, same team had I, Ironside Three in the uh, reboot series. That was way better than anything Voss Ripper did. Voss Ripper never did get past the first round in any competition, though, except for the robotic soccer, which is a bit of a shame, really. It's literally the only good thing they did in the entire series, unfortunately, which is which is the first thing we saw them do as it was well. Pro- it was probably the best threat to Evil Weevil in the soccer, really, assuming it didn't just randomly stop. And then it, for some reason, although I'm pretty sure the commentary didn't pick it up, it started working again towards the end, strangely. So it just kind of sat the fight out between for most of it, and then it decided to just join in at the end. It could have been raised... <laughs> I mean, it could have been. I bet it could have been a radio issue knowing series three because anything was possible in that series. With a lot of know. robots had signal problems and everything, which was a real letdown for that series. Robo Chicken, which was fighting Velociraptor in round one, a more successful machine to an extent. I like the the concept of a robotic chicken, and the team really knew how to get into the spirit of it as well. Um, quite a flimsy looking robot in series 4 with the patented poultry powered pecker at the front, which is basically an axe and the flipping tail feathers at the back as well. The foul flipper. The foul flipper, that was it. I mean, may I say this is probably one of my favourite robots we're going to be covering in this entire podcast because you yeah. can't hate Robo Chicken. And it's also one of those kind of like joke robots that initially in series or it wasn't it wasn't competitive at all. It was there for the joke of it. it you know, it was decent looking, but that's it. But by the time we got to series seven, it's getting to the stage where it's having like really close battles and stuff and actually doing really well. And they got very unlucky in both series five and six, to be quite honest with you. Went out in the first round in series five and six, mainly down to bad luck rather than the quality of the robot itself. And then in the mm. two they started to find success again. Even then considering its draw against Pussycat in the second round, where it got completely creamed. Um, yeah. It was still functional towards the end, despite all the damage that it had taken. And also not forgetting that Razor had pretty much yeah. crushed, through, crushed through its head several times, and it was still fine. Yeah. An admirable performance, considering the robots it faced, because Pussycat would ultimately finish second in that series. Yeah, it ended up with kind of like shredded chicken, essentially, didn't it? It got like crushed right. and ripped up. For pride myself. <laughs> but yes, so, artist- artistically, Robo Chicken was very good. They did some really cool stuff with the um, the actual sculpting of the metal to give it the kind of feathery appearance. The whole idea of the um, the pecker with the ball cocks for the eyes, the big com- comedic eyes, then the rubber glove for the rooster waffle. That was really really cool. They called it Robo Chicken Evil in Series Five, and then went back to Robo Chicken again. It was in the Extreme Two where they reached the finals of the tag team events. And in Series 7, they then went and reached the Heat Final, going out on the judges' decision. In one thing was consistent, though. They kept the head, pretty much. The head. I mean, it never got in. I think they removed it a little bit in Series 7, but for the most part, it was always there. And did, I just enjoyed that. Did the team keep the amazing hats? Don't bl- I think, I think no, by series, they, got, they got rid of it in Series 7, but they had it in Series up until Series 6, at least. Hmm. They were defeated yeah. eventually in Series 7 by Tough as Nails, our man you run there. And oh, not, a, not, not a disappointing robot to lose to. I mean, that was one of the, the, the first robots to use Hardox, so it's not a bad... It was a good robot to lose to. In Series 7, you'd have to be good to make it to the uh, grand, the, the, se- he said, the semi-finals, you know, the semi-final rounds. Yeah, it was it was a tough robot. It was one of those robots that kept going. No matter, I mean... And only robots like Pussycat have been, have been able to fully take it out. I mean, Razor didn't technically even immobilize Robo Chicken. It was still going. You can't kill the chicken. No, definitely not. And it still remains one of my favorite robots, just for the, just for the fact it's it's a bit of a joke, but also can actually fight, which I have to commend. I love a good joke robot that's competitive. Definitely. 
it's more than it's not a one trick pony and yeah i love that about any robot which um can get its face kind of caved in but still kind of keep going so we move on to chronic the wedgehog um from beer in devon it's a very boxy ugly looking robot in series four if i may say so myself but once series five comes along they've streamlined the design with the foam spikes on the top it looks a lot sportier and the flipper is a lot more effective as well i was going to say that's apollo's ancestor you're talking about there well we've all got to start somewhere don't we yeah, I mean, even by Series 7, you can see the Apollo look and the mm. shape of the robot. I mean, obviously, it's not fully there yet, but... This robot was no slouch. It didn't really get far in any of the seasons it appeared in, but it did become the 2005 domestic heavyweight champion mm. after Robot Wars ended. That's pretty impressive, then. I mean, it was definitely one of the earlier kind of, like, uh, live circuit robots, you know, before things like, you know, Iron Ore got to their, hit their stride and Manta and all that kind of thing. And the Russian. The Iron Ore wasn't br- fantastically successful in any of the Robot Wars seasons, but on the live circuit, it was an absolute force. As a matter of fact, I think Chronic, or at least the later iterations of Chronic, it actually had the, uh, the privilege, or possibly the, uh, the misfortune, of being the first robot to ever fight Beta. Beta? Oh, in yes. a, um, it was unofficial. It wasn't even during the event. I think it John Reed had just brought Beta along and wanted to try it against something, mm. and uh, yeah, it just so happened to be up against Chronic, and yeah, Chronic kind of got its skull bashed quite badly, oh. just like it although did when it, um, Terahertz as well. Although interestingly, um, I think Beta actually no, not Beta. Um, I think Chronic actually did score because they did a few fights. Uh, at least one at fearing the victory against Beta as well in that little exchange. Chronic's best performance was still in Series 4 when it reached the Heat Final, uh, but it did make the second round in the Sixth Wars and the Seventh Wars as well, so a moderately successful robot in Robot Wars, much more successful in the live circuit afterwards. I've got to point out, though, before we move on to another robot, is two things. Actually, one, how battered it got after its Thermidor, fo- Thermidor 2 fight, where there's a picture of it on the wiki where its face is just completely destroyed at that point um and also the fact they lost in series seven to mighty mouse of all robots it's mm. just ah, uh, i why mouse Whatever. not such a i'm nice, over it now nice mice i will get to that later on here we come to warhog this is definitely one of the unluckier robots to have appeared in robot wars as although it boasted a very destructive weapon it never once got past the first round I mean, they didn't just boast it. They had one. <laughs> Warhog was genuinely terrifying. As a, like, um, I mean, forgetting the brief moment where they kind of give it a little spin when we could kind of tell just how heavy, how much weight they were packing into that, into that disc. It was just laying into things left, right, and center. Because, I mean, I recall it taking off um, or taking out arena walls. I recall it just pretty much turning Dreadnought into fine powder. It's uh, it's a dangerous bit of kit, but it just couldn't really drive terribly well. I have to concede my memory of Rip Warhog is pretty poor, so I should have probably done my research first. <laughs> yeah, they ripped off the entire front of Dreadnought. Dreadnought, of course, was only made of fiberglass, wasn't it? It did, but... Well, impressive for the time. I mean, given the fact there weren't, there weren't many full-body spinners in Robot Wars. It was, it was doing some- it was trying to do something different, and it was a lot more, a lot more threatening than Banshee, for example, another full body. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually, it was kind of the opposite of problem of Banshee. Where Banshee was really slow and spinner wasn't very effective. This rope was really effective, but it couldn't take the hits very well, like if at all. After a few hits of like running into a robot, it would just die like every time. The exterior of it was really tough, though. I don't think anything mm. really was capable of badly hurting it. It's just, yeah, its internals did leave something to be desired, considering how... Point you build, the spinner, stuff. of course, is now aware that you have to be able to take your own hits as well as the opponent uh, uh, taking those hits, too. Yeah, I mean, this robot was also originally going to be called Taz, with lots of Zeds on it. Mm. Um, but I think, I, think, I think it was also probably a um, copyright thing, maybe. I don't yeah. know. Or, or they just... Funny, you can actually see like whether why it's all brown and stuff. That's the reason why because the original image of it, you can see the more brownish Taz design on it. But 
Maybe they would yeah. go for a Tasmanian Devil aesthetic first, and then they just go, went with the uh, Warthog theme afterwards. I have a feeling that was probably meant on saying, yeah, you can't really use licensed Looney Tunes characters in the show. Yeah. Funny, they, they say that, but then Supernova came in with the, with the logo twice. With, with, the so. super, with the Superman logo, yeah. Yeah, so it was a bit hit or miss with the rules sometimes, it was, as per usual. Yeah, if we look at a series, there's actually a picture on the wiki of an early version of Warhog, which does bear a resemblance to the Tasmanian Devil there before they changed it. Yeah, I mean, at least they're able to improvise it and make it into a completely different thing, which is kind of funny how it just sort of kept that design from this this kind of improvised design eventually became the basis for all the rest of its appearances. Very poor performance against Napalm 2 in Series 5. It was really sad to see it go out that way. In the Sixth Wars, <sighs> it did face against Smidzy and St. Agro, which should be a future uh, semi-finalist, of course. So they they did face some tough opponents in the last uh, their last appearance. Yeah, it was pretty stacked for them, unfortunately. I mean, it was kind of the same thing with like uh, Chompalot in Series 6. So it just had a lot of you know, decent opponents it was against. I mean, Smidzy was able to wall it and Maybe not so um, common get but they didn't really do too much in the fight to get through because St. Agro just wasn't there yet. I think before we move on, though, I'd like to mention I love the helmet that's on top of Warhog from Series 5 and 6. It's like one of those World War One army helmets. Yes, I love that. I love the fact they added it on there. It, the Series 4 one looks so barren in comparison just without the hat. It goes so well with the camouflage aesthetic as well. You know, it's uh, got a good look to it there. I mean, a lot of people would argue that the Warhog Napalm fight is sort of the classic series is equivalent of the Mr. Speed Squared and Foxic fight mm. where it was just, just I think they either forgot to turn the weapon on or the weapon just didn't work but it just it if it was working Napalm probably would have gone out honestly given There's the... always going to be bugs uh, in the system and everything especially um, with robots that may be largely untested but this was its second appearance and there would have been a reason just, just, just plain bad luck really I suppose I mean this is an old robot I think that I would have liked to have seen like Try some kind of similar design in a reboot or like a BattleBots type environment because I think mm. now technology is a lot better with spinners and can making them more durable and making them a lot more effective. I think this could have been like a design that could have been reused, but mm. yeah. the other thing which I'm actually noticing, having looking looking at pictures of it, Warhog is kind of one of the earliest undercutters as well. Mm. Considering a how low the disc is and b where the actual blades are located, it's is riding along the floor. Undercutters were not really a thing back in those days either. No, I, I can't really. I'm trying to think of like a proper undercutter from the classic series. I can't think of one off the bat anyway. The only one I keep thinking of from Road Wars is PP3D, but that's obviously, that's obviously a reboot. So. Yeah, I think Warhog could potentially be the first undercutter in Robot Wars. So, what about Claude Hopper? This was the first walking robot to appear in the main event. It resembles what appears to be some kind of bizarre-looking mantis with those claws sticking out at the front. I have to admit, I do like the way they made the robot as a war. Obviously, now it'd be more of a shuffler by today's standards, but yeah, I love the mechanism on it. It's so smooth. Like other robot, like look at all the walkers that appeared in like series three, and obviously like Jim Struts and stuff. Although they were early, granted, but it looked quite. Although it was only going at three miles an hour, it was quite brisk for a walker in those days. Yeah, I mean, they also had a little um, unique way of making the robot turn. Because obviously, since they don't have legs and they, have, like, they can't do tank steering on it, like a kind of like platform in the middle of it that turns it around like a turret. Mm. Yeah, it's so just so efficient. I mean, is it an effective robot? I mean, not really. It's not an offensive robot by any means, but I do like just the kind of smoothness of it. It just feels like it feels really hard to take out, especially in series five. In contrast to smooth, it's um. Yeah, I'd say that to its Tetna Games incarnation, Claude Hopper, where it turned oh, into a yeah. giant shoe. And Claude it had, Hopper. And it, <laughs> and it had a little rabbit riding along who was being shaken quite literally to death. A couple of the rabbit. Yes. <laughs> Which was hilarious, by the way. I love, I love Claude Hopper. I think they came, didn't they come third or set? I think, they came, I think they got bronze in that event as well, which is pretty impressive for the first time for them. Yeah, if I mean, I know that we're talking about animalistic robots, but yeah, I would say that Claude Hopper would have to be my favourite, but the aesthetics of Claude Hopper was great all the same. I mean, offensively, it probably couldn't really do much, especially not with those um, 
just claws at the front. So it's probably not going to get any kind of real momentum behind them or any kind of real chance to attack. The side-mounted drums was definitely an interesting take on it for the fifth wall, though. Hmm. A good idea for a defensive weapon in theory, although Pussycat made light work of them. However, in the Fifth Wars, Claude Hopper, having gone out in round one in series four, became the first walking robot to make it to the second round after defeating Twister, which, well, as we all know, was not renowned for its reliability. And in fact, it was one of only two walkers, I believe, that even made it past the first round. Obviously, Anarchy did it in series uh, six as well. Hmm. But... No, I, I love I love the series five Claude Hopper purely because it's like back in some kind of RPG we have a person who's really tanked out with all this really heavy heavy armor but absolutely no f- offense at all and it's really slow. Mm-hmm. It's purely a defensive robot. But I still, I mean, I'm just happy the fact we finally got a walker that could that was actually durable in a mm-hmm. way. Like, I mean, Pussycat was taking lots of hits here. We broke one of its weapons off and it kind of just got hit multiple mm-hmm. times and because it's so solid, it just didn't die. It just kept going. I think um, Claude uh, Hopper really sort of set the standard for combat robots that could walk, while Anarchy's the one that um, perfected it. Oh yeah, definitely. But also, um, I believe also Anarchy was like the built-up larger version of Scuttle, which they also had in Techno games as well. Oh, so Scuttle B Squared. Mm-hmm. Scuttle B Squared, as it was called in Techno games, and it absolutely decimated any kind of opposition I had in the heavyweight sprint that it mm. came known to. Fine piece do. of engineering. So, what should we cover next? Um, Millennium Bug. We'll go with Millennium Bug because we're talking about walking robots. This one's larger and more ponderous than Claude Hopper. The leg's made out of scaffolding pipes. It has a bludgeoning disc weapon at the back, although because the robot's so slow, um, it's very easy to avoid. Yeah, it was also a face spinner, which aren't really some of the... There's not many robots that have tried face spinners and Probably for good reason. Invertebrate's the only other one I can think of off the top of my head with a spinner like that. Technically, Combat Ant was as well in the Ant Weights, but that mm. was... And that was quite scary, actually, on Combat Ant, but yeah, in, it, in the upper weight class, it wasn't terribly effective. Mm. It was... I think Millennium Bug was less of a... It was more fun for the team and how pathetically it went out. It just got lifted onto its back and it couldn't do anything, and then it gets put on the sol- on the flipper, and the legs comedically running like a little beetle flipped on its back, <laughs> and then it gets put on the <laughs> in the floor flipper, and it still doesn't get self righted. Incredible, it's even sadder. An interesting yeah. thing which I noticed is um, Merlinburg was one of the earliest robots that actually debuted in the Robot Wars magazine when they were talking about the Series Four qualifiers. Ah. Um, the thing I find really interesting is that, of course, it had that little forklift on the back of Melanium Bug for the series. Uh, that wasn't actually there in the qualifiers, so they must have added that really quite quickly just to add that to a robot. Seems quite... I don't know. Um, how does one just casually add lifting forks to your robot in between auditions and filming? Because I don't think the... Uh, it looks like they just kind of tacked them on at the last minute with not a great deal of thought given to it. Yeah, but even then, that's I was quite impressed that they were able to add that in the short time they had. Mm. I mean, this is also on the um, the robots that actually, I think it's probably the only one I can think of that appeared in Techno Games but didn't have its name changed. It's still called Millennium Bug in Techno, and it got bronze as well. Another bronze yeah. competitor. It was just naked. <laughs> it it, it, it looked it like it been stripped down for parts and just kept the all they needed to use was that, and that's it. Just like Scuttle B squared. Oh, definitely. Another interesting thing to notice is that in Series 4, there was the robot Millennium Bug, but of course there was Millie and Bug as well, both relating to the Millennium Bug sort of thing. Joe, you know, that took me years to realise that Millennium Bug, Millie and Bug was a pun on the word Millennium Bug. I did not know that. If I'm being perfectly honest, I didn't realise it until earlier in the podcast, and I just thought I would be too cool to admit it. So, uh, yeah, I'll admit it now. I didn't realise that either. Oh, well, there. Moving swiftly on, we go back to good old dinosaur-themed robots with Spikosaurus. What can we say about this one? Fast. Very fast. It's got the roll bars on the top. I had a radio-controlled car called Revolver, which had roll bars on the top, a bit like this. Spikosaurus basically... Uh, beefs that up a bit, so it's a passive self-writing mechanism. Yeah, I mean, its biggest flaw was kind of like Rambot, where it just lacked any sort of control. 
Like it had all the offense and a decent amount of like you know strength and how fast it was, but I think that's probably what let it down in this actual fight. That while it was entertaining, it wasn't as well driven as anything else. So it kind of just relied on hoping it would run into another robot. I mean, I think within the Northern Annihilator and in its heat, it just got stuck in the wall. Or able to move. Let's not forget that it won the Northern Annihilator. It did. That was the real surprise package. It took a it took a beating. Like everything, every robot at some point hit it with their weapon. Like it got spiked multiple times by like, like Dominator Two and Killer Hertz, and it ended up surviving. Like Dominator Two is known for being quite reliable in terms of not dying, and yet it was the only time I could think of where they just stopped working. Scorpion. Now I've got an interesting. I've got an. In- I've got an interesting bit of trivia about Scorpion. I actually saw Scorpion on the first day of Series 4 qualifiers, and it didn't actually have the face drawn onto it yet. So if you can imagine what Scorpion looks like, but without any face, it was a very weird-looking machine. It would have been a bit better. It would have looked uglier without the face. Yeah, it it did. And um, it actually lost its qualifying fight. Um, I believe it went up against the... Ro- uh, it's ages ago, so I can't remember. But I seem to remember it went up against a very early version of Cedric Slammer. Mm. And um, yes, basically Scorpion was was immobilized, but I believe they were just chosen just for the the artistic quality of the robot. Plenty of weaponry on it, anyway. Like four cut, like three cutting discs and a chainsaw that goes up and down. I yeah, believe it's it like it was. I believe it's like the last robot that brought in like cutting disc into Robot Wars, or one of the last. Like they almost vanished by series five. So in the series five, Scorpion ditches the scary face, or actually, to be more accurate, it did not qualify for series five. In extreme, it ditches the scary face. Um, has a beefier cutting saw on the back. They've got no saws in the front now. A pair of lifting forks. And then in series six, Spirit of Scorpion. It's the same idea, but it's now invertible. Definitely a more sensible uh, way to go about things. Yeah, I mean, I do like the sleekness. Mm. Their later versions. I mean, this, the extreme one is kind of a weird hybrid of the two. Uh, yeah, doesn't have the face at least. <laughs> but yeah. series seven yeah. looks different. It's like they've gone and put the the cutting disc at the front now, and they've painted it black. No, series seven is the shiny version. The shiny series. one, the one that got past the first round, but it did take quite a bit of a tanking from IG eighty eight in doing so. Yeah, I mean, it was this pred- It was the sequel to Vader, or like the, kind of mm. the brother of Vader, I suppose. They both appeared in Series 7, but... Yeah. Yeah, his front got completely ripped up, and it was very lucky that robots like Tomahawk and Stagger with it, with it otherwise, these issues. And then it goes out against Dan Tomkia in Round 2, which is not a bad robot to lose against. Yeah, Series 7 and Dan Tomkia was really in its stride, and it's heat anyway. Yeah, Scorpion is technically responsible for Spinner's uh, being banned on the live circuit for a while. I believe Spinner was just either spun up too fast or it was too heavy or powerful or something, but I think it broke through one of the walls, it, which as a result basically got rid of him. It took him a long time to re- reinstate Spinner's again, but I think after that they had to reduce the amount of like, the RPM they could spin or how heavy they could be or stuff, because mm. yeah, Scorpion is one of those unassuming robots you'd think that would do so much de- cause so much um, percussions for people, but yeah, it actually mm. did it. Yeah. So we were talking about con- talking about the ramifications of not having controlled aggression earlier with Spikosaurus. Here was another one that fell victim to that. Rambot. First round loser in a very close first round battle, if not the closest first round battle of Series 4, where it fought against Arnold Terminator and Exterminator. I may say, I think Rambot was the best robot in Series 4 not to make it past the first round, in my opinion. I can definitely agree with that. It's be tied with Gravedigger as well. Gravedigger was very unlucky, and Rambot was as well, just the quality of opponents it faced. Yeah, it was, again, it was all down to its driving, really. It was very aggressive, but it, I mean, there's the points where it just drives into the wall, it just drives under robots without doing anything. It had a really smooth slide onto Sergeant Bash, though, which I quite liked. I love the sleek, low-profile aesthetics. Had a pair of spikes on the back, and another pair of spikes on the front that could lift up and down. Yeah, this robot is only 25 centimetres tall as well, which is terrifyingly short. Uh, 25 centimetres tall at the back end as well. This was a long robot. And this is according to the stat boards, and they can be a bit iffy sometimes with what they measure, but even if it's only about 30, I mean, I think Griffin was only 20, so it's not much... Griffin was only 12, I believe. 
Yeah, it was very low. It was one of the lower robots. Probably one of the lowest robots mm. of um, of Series 4, but I, I just I, I liked the look of it, and I'm kind of disappointed that Double Trouble, which they brought in Series 6, was a bit underwhelming. Yeah. Like, it was, I don't know, like it just looked like a really bad version of Shredder at that point. We mentioned briefly Spawn of Scutter. That kind of had a sort of um, bull sort of theme going for it, didn't it? Yeah, the, oh, the Spawn of Scutter. I, that's my favourite Scutter bot. It Me always too. will be because you know as soon as it got into, as soon as it became um you know um their version of series again. yeah spawn again series five onwards it just uh, lost a lot of its personality for me didn't quite do it for me no yeah anyway here's a bull type robot that does have a lot of character and personality terrible from the final heats of series four yeah I mean I I do like the look of terrible. Like mm-hmm. I do like the way the arm lifts up, and it's got. And again, the pun is also really good. The pun is good. Um, my only problem is that, it's, <laughs> admittedly, they did kind of take the more cowardly way out and not do well against Razor Blade, just so that they didn't have to fight Hypnodisc, which is understandable, but also, <laughs> you know, a little bit weird. Randomly comes back in series six, where it goes out in round one against uh, Tornado and Inshredible and Hedgehog. Yeah, admittedly, oh, this is something I heard from David March, uh, from Andrew, Andrew March, and sorry, apparently, what actually happened was um, they thought that Inshredible was already out. Mm-hmm. Um, Edgehog had already been out ages ago. They thought Inshredible was actually immobilized because it was barely moving. So for fun, they just pushed Terrible into the pit, and they saw that Inshredible was still moving. They had to apologize to the Terrible team after saying, sorry, we wouldn't have pitted you otherwise. So they actually went out for no reason in a weird way. Such a travesty, isn't it? What could have been? It was funny though. I mean, it's just it's just so it's such a clean pitting as well. If like almost like halfway across the arena, it just slides it into the pit. <laughs> even like even like JP was like completely put Taking off, off surprise, guard. Mate. Came out of nowhere. <laughs> he was like he was literally about to say, "Oh, uh, tornado and terrible about to go through," and then just half, halfway through that sentence, they get pitted. <laughs> Moving on to series five, quick honorable mention goes to Rohog. Which is basically based on a uh, Rohog, a kind of beetle, and it crunched like a beetle too when it was destroyed in its only battle. I, mean, I know we're not talking too much for Rohog, but I gotta point out the fact that this robot couldn't lift the weight limit of Series Five. That is dreadful. If you go into ro- into a robot fighting event, you have to make sure your lifting weapons can lift at least um, your own weight. I think it could only lift Gemini or half of Gemini, maybe maybe Napalm. Yeah, not good. So Black Widow in Series Five. Spider themed robots discuss. They give it to Hypnodisc in its first fight. What on earth was that all about? Sacrificial lamb. Oh, I see what we did there. Uh... <laughs> Actually, I feel like in the series, but I mean, every time I hear Black Widow, I just because I've got battle bots on the brain, I keep thinking of the robot that never even made appearance in, in the current series of battle bots, also called Black Widow. Um, 200 kilos maxing out the weight limit, and what with webbing on it that could probably qualify as an entanglement device. I don't know. It was also covered in fur as well, which was also technically an entanglement device, although you wouldn't have thought so by early Robot Wars logic. But... Mm. Yeah, they were a bit more forgiving with fur, I think, because obviously Deator existed as well. They kind of had to make us had to be a bit more lenient with it. Yeah, the fur is there for being set on fire, if nothing else. I mean, this robot is massive, but I've got to admit, it does look very weedy for a robot that is 200 kilos. Like, it doesn't feel like it's going to be 200 kilos. I know it's got all the we- leg mechanisms on it. It's quite thin. Like, the main body is quite chunky, but the rest of it is very thin in comparison. Um, it probably didn't help the legs were relatively chopped off by uh, Hypnodisc really easily, which is a bit of a shame, because for a newcomer with a new robot that's a walker, and to pull up against... <laughs> the uh, robot that came, you know, came, got into the grand final last time and was second in Series 3. Very unlucky. Another robot that appeared in the same heat was Lamzy. This one is actually an amalgamation of two animals. You've got the sheep mascot on the top, but the robot itself is apparently based on the wolf. Yeah, the wolf in sheep's clothing uh, analogy for it. Um, i got to say... Ended by Team Coyote, as it was called. No relation to Jamie McCarg's robot. Uh, I mean... It's the, here's the big question, though. Who did it better, the sheep on Lamsey or the ninja sheep from Megamorg? Mm. It's, it's mm. tough. I think I'm always going to have to prefer the ninja sheep. I like, I like this sheep really more just because I like the cube shape. It looks like, like a PS1 yeah. game or something. It's like something out of some sort of obscure French 3D animation where all the everything is just really blocky and um, 
designed in a bizarre way. I say French because so many of the most bizarre animated films I've seen came from France, like Belleville Rendezvous, for example. And that is an awesome film. But we're going a bit off track here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they actually managed to, they actually got a win at least. They beat, they beat Whoa What, um, probably one of the strangest creations Anne McClark has ever made. Um, mm. in, a good, in a good way, of course, but and, and they also later appeared in the minor uh, meltdown, but it came second to Bigger Brothers. So that's that's pretty fair play, honestly. Yep. Now we've got Hippobotamus. This was built by um, one half of the All Torque team from Series 2 and 3. He comes with Series 4's Small Torque, which is a bit of a downgrade, and then Fighting Torque in Extreme 1, which is an even greater downgrade. And then there is this. It's basically Fighting Torque, but it's now a plastic sand pit. Now, this is a robot I have a passionate dislike for, because, yeah. man, I hate this robot so much. Mm. I think it's because I was such a fan of all talk in Series 2, and particularly in Series 3. All it's... talk was like a precursor to Tornado, before Tornado came. Yeah, pre- yeah, pretty much Series 3 was Tornado, you know, and also, yeah. it was just so cool looking. And then, you know, small talk, fair enough, they tried something different, it didn't work. I can, ex- I can kind of accept that one. Now but... it's like, just don't even <sighs> care anymore. Yeah, but, I mean, then they also have the fighting talk version they had in um, the their, yeah. uh, qualifier battle, which was just terrible. This one... Probably decided, oh, we're not going to be competitive enough. Let's just go in with a plastic sandpit or something just really, really weird and stuff. Um, I mean, Martin Sauce came back with Bot Out of Hell, which aesthetically is um, more interesting to look at, I would say. I would agree. I mean, I think also kind of what irritates me slightly about this robot is that they seem to treat it not as a joke. No. Like, like, I mean, there are, there are robots like, um, I don't know, like Dome or something, where if they talked, the, the team clearly didn't, were, weren't too, like, obsessed with their robot being good. They were having fun. It, it didn't, it felt like they were, I mean, obviously, I'm sure they had fun with this robot as well, but it never came across any point where, like, they were there for, in on the joke. Yeah. Like, it was just, like, Robo Chicken, for example, you know, they were kind of, you know, with the little head hats and stuff, while here it was like, mm. yeah, we're going to do our best here, and it's like, made all talk. Why did you go back to? Why did you go to this? It's so, oh, I don't know. It just it's fury. It's been a personal level. And we moved on to Decapitator. Decapitator, yes. I actually Oops. thought trivia. I drove an Antwerp version of the Antwerp Anarchy representing Wales, and I, I drove it into the pits because I couldn't control the darn thing. It was so fiddly. In is, I mean, this is probably a contender for one of the best pun robots ever. Yeah. Wise. It's, and it, it had sibs for eyes. Yes. <laughs> and sparkly wings, and it's just it, and it's just so funny. Like, it's got a nice look to it. It's got a nice aesthetic. You can't fault it for that. I mean, it's unfortunate you're going to go against Firestorm in your first fight. I mean, you yeah. know, Black Widow situation all over again. No active weapons. Well, you have got a rotating drill, I suppose. Um, it's, but that's no, barely uh, active at this point. It'd be cool if the wings could have been used to self right the robot, but it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. So really light at seventy one kilos for series five. That's that. I mean that that was that was slightly that was considered slightly too light for series four. Mm. It's almost like they didn't get the memo about the weight increase. Oh dear. Um, although there is actually one thing I do find hilarious about this robot in retrospect is that technically un- or inadvertently anyway, we're responsible for Firestorm's weapon being destroyed almost at, like half broken for the rest of the series. Huh. Because after the series, because that was obviously because it was half Firestorm's fault was the fact that they were involved in it. Like the, they got bent their whole flipper in like to the side. Ever since that fight, you never see Firestorm's weapon like fully close again. It's always slightly open. And I think that's because of the damage that happened to them. Who'd have thought that a little bee could do all that damage? Yeah. Well, the bee didn't. It was Matilda. But they they were they they, they got they got the participation trophy in terms of causing that damage. So we'll, we'll give him it. We'll give him it. We'll give him it. Uh, so, next one on the list is Rough Rough Dougal, our Man of Wayne's favourite robot. How can you hate Rough Rough Dougal? It's incredible. <laughs> oh, Incredibly it's... fragile because it was destroyed by the steam vents that were in the arena. Its ears went flying off. Well, the decoration got damaged. As far as the rest of it, it was pretty tough, at least by Zero Six, it, it had gotten pretty tough. I mean, it went through the whole fight completely on fire, and it was fine. The I do find it interesting the kind of weapon that Ruff of Dougal actually has, which is the firewall powered spike on the underside. An interesting which is choice. A very interesting choice for powering a weapon like that. At which point, I suppose nowadays you just think, why wouldn't you just use a flywheel 
as an offensive weapon in itself. But um, yeah, what do you think they were trying to achieve with that? Maybe they were just trying to go for something a bit different. I don't know. I mean, I mean, all this stuff with Ruffalo Dugo eventually led us to the little Pup Pup Dugo, which appeared in um, a Robo Nerd in 2019, which was Pup Pup Dugo took part in the Content Creators Rumble and um, sadly got pitted, but it didn't do bad at all, really. I think it was like one of the Seems sick. Robots. So I took part in that Rumble as well. I had Volpa. I came second. Uh, but Pup Pup Dugo, that was. Uh, I think that came fifth or sixth, didn't it? Sixth. It came it, sixth. Yeah, yeah, it came sixth. I mean, I, I had the honour. Well, I'm probably one of the people that actually got to hold this thing proper because I mean, because we I shared a hotel with Owen and uh, Anderson, and I got to hold this thing on the on the ride there on my lap. So it was like a little, a little stroke, a little stroke, a little dog, like a, like a, some kind of evil villain or something. Owen even gave a collar and a leash, which was awesome. A stroke of genius there, I thought. It was very cute detail. I think that yep. was also paying homage to his um his dog as well. So that yes. was always nice. Very good. Crustacean. This one um, known to represent South Africa in the second World Championship and in Commonwealth Carnage. Also, it went and reached the heat final in Series 5. What can we say about Crustacean? It's got one of my possible favourite pittings of any robot ever. Uh, where it just grabs hold of them off and just dumps it. Yeah. It was very clean. The way the claws are operated, of course, there's a bit of a novelty to it, where one of the team members has some goalie gloves, and has, and basically when he closes his hands, the claws close with it. Quite a clever idea. It was clever, but I will admit, they got a bit too overzealous with constantly showing shots of his hands grabbing. Like It's like every single time it was Crustacean was ever in the series, it, apart from obviously in Series 8, where Series 9, where it barely appears. Yeah. It was like, they were like... Oh my god, the claw the he's crushing he's closing his hands for like the tenth time. We've seen it was we've seen that. We know we know by now. But the novelty does wear off after a while, which is uh yeah. clever though. I, mean, I can't fault him for it. It's just, it's just that was more of a problem with the show with having to keep constantly showing it and reminding yeah. us that this thing exists. Even they actually took out Robo Chicken Evo in round one before they took out Behemoth before losing to Wheelie Big Cheese in the heat final. Um reaches the second round of series six going out to Chaos Two. And Commonwealth Carnage reaches the finals where it loses to Firestorm. Series 7 goes out in round 1. Again, with, this time Behemoth is the one that, that um, basically flips out the arena, avenging its defeat in Series 5. Yeah, a bit of pro-revenge right there. I quite like that. Comes to the semi-finals of the Third World Championship, and then in Series 9, the reboot, it appears. And that's all that happened to it. <laughs> yeah, it was against Apex, Ironside 3, and Pulsar, so... It had no chance. I mean, it was two two of the most powerful spinners of Series 9. No. Let's move on to Series 6. At Series 6 point, I think a lot of the, um, shall we say, the artistic interpretations of animalistic robot, shall we say, were kind of being, for the most part, left behind. And that's not really any more obvious than in our first one, which we're going to talk about is Wasp, or What a City Project, which was pretty much... M- robotic it was it was a robot shape but with wasp kind of coloring beyond this one i didn't think we really saw much in the way of actual animal looking robots apart from maybe the old one or two wasp basically reminds me a bit of decapitators to the point it actually kind of got the two robots confused at one point yeah i mean the one most confusing thing about this robot is that it's um according to the data on the wiki at least apparently its top speed is 20 miles an hour I think we barely um, saw him go faster than four, did we? I don't think it even got out of the corner, I don't think, in its entire fight. I mean, a fair play to the team, though. At least they knew that robot wasn't very good. Like, they weren't typing it up. Philippa was seeing in the pit thing, please tell me the spike at least shoots out. And the guy's like, nah, it's fixed. <laughs> oh, it's, it's also the only robot, I believe, that actually took a lot of damage from the dr- from to kill lots of drill. Because that robot, that, that was mostly just used for lifting things up nowadays. But it actually got straight in there and just ripped it open. All the, Very is, all the damage is superficial. A bit like a robot. Yeah. Went out against Razor, Raging Reality, in round one, with the other victim being Brutus Maximus. Not much else to really say about Wasp, is there? No, I mean, I, I, when I was doing my heat on it ages ago, I had nothing to say about this robot, virtually. <laughs> kind of get a in issue. It, it, was, of... it was there, I think, is all we can really say about it. Mm-hmm. Moving on though, Cedric Slammer. This one definitely is one that made a bit more of an impression, I would say. A very unanimalistic looking machine, but with Cedric Monkey at the helm. 
the mascot, the monkey itself really does take, it really does um, bring some personality to the robot, I would say. Yeah, I do like it. I felt very bad for this robot, honestly, because they did so well in the um, in the in the uh, what new blood championship. They did. Um, got very unlucky in their heat going against Firestorm, and the fact that self rider got stuck on the they got over the self rider like, opened up on the back, so they couldn't self rider again. Yeah, um, bad way to go out, really. Megahertz two gets through by the skin of its teeth. Yeah, electric spinning disc. Basically, it's a car wheel. Yeah, it's like a car wheel with little studs on it, essentially. But it did a decent amount of damage again, like in the um, in the New Blood. It did the business? Yeah. I mean, it lost to robots like Mute and Thor, which you know aren't the most worst robots to lose. Mm. Um, it's also one of the few robots that's the nearest robot to me. Um, like there, there, there are not many robots that are in like a twenty mile radius of me. I think all I can think of is Cedric Slammer, Megahertz, and Bolt from the Blue. <laughs> so, and. If I go slightly further, I do. If I go, if I go slightly further, sorry, I, I do get to um, I do get eruption and big nipper, but I have to go a bit further out to get to those guys. Yeah, my mum's from Cumbria, and it's a bit of a shame that only robot from Cumbria is bought from the blue. Yeah, I mean, I'll, ha I'll happily take Cedric Slammer and Megahertz though, just for the novelty of it, but not getting any hard hitters per se, really, in my area. Destructosaur, right? It's basically a barrel-shaped robot made of plastic with what looks like the jaws of life on the front. It gets perforated by iron ore and flipped over by, I think, Chaos 2, was it? And it can't self right. Yeah, it was supposed to have the barrel shape similar to something like um, Spikosaurus, which is also weird because they've almost got a similar name. Um, where there was. Uh, yeah, except it got right flipped like, onto its back almost instantly without any kind of rollabout. It was next to another robot when it, it was next to iron ore when it happened. It didn't even get a chance to do that. Um, so it's trying to, be, trying to do the morgue, what, what the morgue used to do. Yeah, it's it's funny actually because in its fight, Chaos Two was like taking no prisoners. It just flipped over to saw in the first second, yeah. flipping itself over in the process. But then it flips Iron Ore out the arena like in like ten seconds later. So it's just, it's just it had no mercy in Series Six. It felt felt really bad for Iron Ore there. Definitely, because that was that would I mean as we saw from Series Seven, which hadn't changed that much from what I mean, it was actually a decent robot. So it's a bit of a shame that they ended <laughs> up going out, but yet the mouse got through. But yeah, whatever. Mighty Mouse in the same heat. This is basically Velociripper, but now a mouse. And its main form of attack was rather just to run away. And it was effective in that sense, to, to be fair. Yeah, I mean, one, one aspect about uh, Mighty Mouse I sometimes forget about is that the eyes actually are facing in different directions. Which is funny to me. I don't know why I find that funny. Just the eyes are lopsided. I can't hate Mighty Mouse. I love the, cute, the cutesy of it. It was in Techno Games as Mighty Mouse as well, actually, because Techno Games came out first. Mighty Mouse didn't do too well in Techno Games in most of the events that I saw. It, of it. It, it did quite well but... in the obstacle course, and that was, that was what, it was what it was made for, I believe. In much. the obstacle course, it it thoroughly did well. So it came like second or third in the obstacle course, I believe. Yeah, it was not. It didn't do well in Togo War, unfortunately, but then it just wasn't built for that sort of thing. When you've got Storm Chaser, Tornado. <laughs> And um, Sprocket or Smidzy, or as we know it better, in um... it came second to a uh, Typhoon Rover, so it got silver in the obstacle course, which is it's the kind of robot that definitely would have done well in like series one and two, but not like not would have done well in the battles, probably pretty much. Um, it did get what looked like some sort of an active weapon on it by series seven, though, fitted at the back, looked like a couple of spinning, which it never discs. really used, it still just ran away from everything still. Mm -hmm. The, I think it was, the, I think they only added them on there like Storm Two did, just so they could get in having an active weapon. But then the whole point of the, but then it was nonetheless effective. It reached the second round in series six, and in series seven, it actually got to the heat final where it lost to Thermidor Two. Yeah, I mean, I like the look of Mighty Mars, but I think I've always had an issue with it purely because it was never aggressive. It was always just running away, and yeah, you know, I, I get that. You know, and I can understand it in the first round. There's like four robots in one battle, and you got like stay active, but I think I think by by, by you could go fight at some point. You know? You've got to have aggression. That's that's what makes the most entertaining battles. And it, it worked for them again. They beat Chronic because they just died while running away from him, and then they got to a heat final. But mm. I don't know. It just doesn't feel very interesting per se as much. It just feels a lot more yeah. annoying at that point. Moving on back to the insect kingdom, it is the stag, and this one appeared in series six and series seven. There was a featherweight version called Staglet, which um, took part in the featherweight final of um, Extreme 2, I believe. 
Yes, it did. Um, great team name of Team Bodget. Feels very appropriate hmm. for this robot. I mean, it's it's funny how in Series Six it looks very more it looks more like insect alien like with like, the big eyes, and in Series Seven it went straight for googly looking eyes again, which is more appropriate. The pincers in the front do look quite flimsy, though, don't they? Like, it doesn't help they've got holes in them. Yeah, it it wasn't a very um, effective robot. I mean, its forks got completely bent by Vader. Like after like one hit, it was just lifted up. Didn't get past the first round in either of its appearances. Uh, but hey, Stacklet did all right at least. You know. Yeah, Stacklet was quite a cute little one. I think it probably enjoyed more success than its heavyweight brother. This is the scary thing. I remembered Staglet, but I did not remember the stack. Even though they're almost the same robot, but just smaller. Just smaller, yeah. Okay, so this is one that um, I remember for infamous reasons from the reboot, more so, but Chompalot made its debut in Series 6, a dragon themed robot. So, by far, one of the unluckiest draws ever in Series 6, and in Series 7 as well, to be fair. And more so in Series 6. I mean, yeah. Series 8, sorry, not Series 7, because Thermidor 2, Stinger, and 13 Black. That's... That's, that's Pretty top. stacked. I mean, yeah, I mean obviously, obviously, 13 Black was yet to show its true potential, because it was only appeared once in Series um, 5, but yeah, you got a former semi, you got a semi finalist in the previous series, and you, and you got and you got a grand finalist as well. It's like that's that's unfortunate, you know. Some oh, previous series before that, but still, it's like quite a change. And they, they they did well to their credit; they survived quite longer than I thought they would. Took part in the Extreme Series Two Iron Maidens event, where it actually managed to get to the final. Yeah, it did. Yeah, I mean, it lost eventually to. I uh, know oh, it beat Pussycat. I think. I think it won. Uh, oh wait, it did win again. It actually Overall did win. Yes, it managed to it managed to grab hold of Pussycat like the the arm where like the arm and the saw was and just go into the pit. Good driving. <laughs> and they got very lucky against Bayamoth admittedly because they shouldn't manage to hit the removable link out of it and just immobilize any chance of them winning. Yeah. Then of course we also we also more remember um, anything Chomplot did. Was nothing compared to Series 8, where they completely burnt out. Yes. They got past the first round uh, against Pulsar and Ironside and Thermidor, but then against Gabriel, um, they just the, the, the batteries caught fire, started smoking, and then burst into flames. It was damaged beyond repair and could not fulfill the rest of its fixtures, which was it was it was tragic. It was not like Rapids in Series 10, where they were um, really lapping it up and enjoying it and everything. This was a lot more tragic. I mean, this was the reason why uh, Pulsar got reinstated. Because this robot ends up burning out massively. Oh, yeah. And the biggest lipo fire in the entire series, up there with um, Rapid in the grand final of Series 10. Yeah. Yeah, the reboot saw not very many sort of lipo fires. But yeah, Chompots was quite notable. It's a shame because um, I think by the time that Series 8 had rolled around, I think Chomplot was kind of starting to show its age a little bit, especially when it was coming up against things like Ironside. Yeah, it's actually quite, it's actually quite cool. Mm. This, this team also owned a animal-themed robot in techno games, the uh, Boyant, um, which did really well in uh, 2002. In 2003, it fell over, unfortunately. Just very unlucky. Mm. But I do like Boyant as well, and also the name alone makes it so much more worth it. One last robot for Series 6. Got quite a bit of character to this one. Didn't get past the first round in any of its appearances, but quite a looker. It's the Hassux Hog. I do, I do like this robot a lot. Looks a bit like Iron Ore, doesn't it? But without the axe. And particularly the Series 6 version. The Series 7 version is a little bit more of a more boxy in appearance. It looks um, more like, a bit more like an early version of Manta, doesn't it? From the Series 7 version. We can't forget on Hassux Hog 2, they had the uh, underpants on the bottom plate, which was very amusing. <laughs> it was, I, I, it's one of those robots I do think a lot of people kind of forget about, but I do like the personality of it. Like, it really has a lot of good paint scheme. It's got a nice design to it. I, I do actually think it's. I appreciate it a lot more looking back on it than actually when I was watching it in our jungle. But I do like it. On to series seven, the last of the classic series. You have Shellshock. No relation to the robot from series three. 
Um, I would argue prob a bit more bloated than the one from Series 3 as well. It looks a bit more um, bulbous. If I'm wrong, but I know this is made by the uh, Fat Boy Tin team from Series 4, but I believe they think the base is on that snail that got stuck was actually inside the robot at the time in Series 4. As they went, well, well let's just make it a, make a, a, you know, a snail robot instead. Hmm. And it didn't last very long in the oh. series. It, uh, M2 made sure of that, at least. Pretty much. Is there anything else we can really say about this robot? It existed, if that we counts did. as uh, something. We didn't really see it for long enough to really comment. No. <laughs> Killer cats, that is basically a poor man's pussy cat. They've covered it, they've decked it out in lots of fur. Not really much else to say. Yeah, this was also the uh, Black Widow team as well, who we talked about previously. Um, the funny thing is, this team would have faced uh, terahertz as well, mm. um, and which would have which would have completely reduced any chance of them um, winning the fight. Um, I did find it weird though that it, it was quite funny how their um, opponents were like almost the same kind of robot, like these two little spinning robots against this giant, ridge shaped robot covered in fur, and it was just getting like battered by these tiny little opponents all the way through. Is pretty funny, but apart from that, the actual robot itself is, like you said, just a very inferior version of you know the Cat Three team or whatever or something like that. Oh, pussy cat, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that too. It's got like kind of a combination of stuff, like the furry look of uh, Cat Three and you've got like, the, the shape of pussy cat, and it didn't really manage to do either right, unfortunately. You too. This will very briefly mention this one. Doesn't really look like an animal, but it has a flipping weapon. Which, um, yeah, but I feel like I suppose the idea is like a sheep or something like headbutt you or something, and the the flipper butts you or something. I don't know. And this was also another secret robot. This was the Lamsey team as well. This team was Hyrule the Lamsey team. team. Which, um, I, I, I kind of like the idea they went for with the flipper. It's kind of like a nice, it's quite a powerful flipper for the time, I guess. Yeah, well, that's not powerful, but it had like some, some lifting power where they actually was able to flip a lot of things, and it wasn't as proven, unfortunately. Um, it wasn't as reliable though, because it ends up losing uh, to Tetanus Booster, I believe. Um, yeah. But the original Lamsey was well, despite how inoffensive the original Lamsey was, it was decently durable. This one in comparison was a bit. So, fortunately, even it was a bit more effective, but not by much, I would say. It takes part in the Annihilator where it comes forth as well. Oh, yes, it wasn't the Annihilator. I forgot about that. It oh. didn't have a fun time in the Annihilator much either, though. It got. It got a few hits in, but most it got battered by Matilda at the end of it. I don't have much else to really say about you two, sadly. It's just kind of a... It's not that, that interesting looking, design-wise, either. Here's a robot that we can say something interesting about, though. Terra Turtle, John Frizzell's robot that keeps on appearing in pre... Um, you, can't, you can't shake this robot off. If it wasn't for the um, reboot series, it, was, it, has, it now has the um, worst win-loss ratio of any robot with no wins and seven losses. Oh, his career. Um, but in... despite that, we kept it kept coming back. Kept coming back. Right, coming back. And I do have a soft spot for it. I mean, is it a great robot? Not really, but well, I admit, I do like the look of it, and it does fit John uh, Frizzell's kind of like um, peace mentality, where like um, it's all made out of like recycled stuff, and it, it's it's got a lot of cha character to it. If it is like a robot that hasn't really changed much since Series Seven, or if at all, he would represent Canada in international um, events as well um, in Robot Wars, like international specials. One of the few teams that represents Canada. There wasn't been that many. Um, yeah. I, can't any other, I can't think of any others apart from um, Rotel have done Canada. Yeah. But the, I mean, the saddest part of the whole career of Territel though was its ending in the. Um, <laughs> in the uh, UK versus the world special where they got completely crumpled by Big Nipper. Aww. And then it had to be officially retired after 14 years of uh, being in the series. Had to be retired officially, which is, it was sad, but also I think at this point it was long overdue. It was kind of um, inevitable, really. We yeah, saw it coming. To... Kind of like The Undertaker, we saw it coming, but we saw it in the day, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rhino in Series 7. There was already a robot in the Extreme called Rhino, which was more based on a Rhino tank. This one here actually does bear a resemblance to a rhinoceros. Very shiny as well. 
I gotta say, I remember we were talking about face spinners before. This is another robot with a face spinner. It looks more like a big tire than an actual spinner, but I do like the look of it. It was it wasn't very effective, unfortunately. It didn't it got pressured rather easily by other robots, particularly Storm 2. The team previously um, entered with reactor. You'd never guess, would you? Based no. off the robot design. It's completely different. It is. Reaches the second round, um it goes out against the Steel Avenger. But so, yeah, I mean, it was very lucky to get past the first round. In where, fairness. Yeah, because Storm Two was in that and Supernova. Yeah, I mean, it was just it was just a case of Supernova losing both its tires and being unable mm. to like. Oh no, no losing that. It just kind of lost like its wheels got like uh, drive got wrecked. And it got rammed in by Storm Two a lot. I mean, barely squeaked by, and then it ended up getting completely uh, thrashed by uh, the Seal Avenger as well. But in a, in a good fight, but it it was ultimately going to lose. Yeah, Cobra, a robot that appears in Series Seven. It's no relation to the one that appears in the um, international special of the reboot series that represented Belgium. This one here is a strange-looking robot. It's like two-wheel drive with a snake um, sticking, or well, sort of snake head at the front. Pneumatic spike is the weapon. Don't really much else to say about it. Really, it's invertible. It barely, it barely drove this robot. Like it was always, its drive was very. Um, very uh, unreliable. So this thing also appeared in techno games as well. Also, where it did mo over. mostly the same thing, where it, yeah, it was, definitely it was, got out the starting blocks. Mm. It was supposed to appear in the obstacle course, and it just it just instantly started spinning in a circle without any chance of going forwards. And I'll say, out of all of the um, animal themed robots we talked about, particularly in the later series, I would say this is probably one of the weakest ones. Mm. Really, apart from the little cobra head and on the there's front of it, really, that's animalistic, is there? I mean, the spike, it's... The, the snake's tongue, I suppose. But that's the thing, though, like yeah, one on one is kind of the same kind of thing, and it, it didn't feel anything animal-like. So it just, they just, they just kind of just called it cobra and stuck a little like foam head on the front of it, and yeah. it's now an animal robot, I guess. It's probably the the least animal-like, but yeah, you do. Not really one that um, is would be argued as a keeper. It was uh, it fought against the Kraken in the first round as well. The Kraken's a bit more inspired. There's no relation to the Kraken that you see in BattleBots, of course. What we have here is a robot with two sort of crushing weapons. You have the one on the outside, which is pneumatic powered to clamp onto opponents, and then one that's inside, which is hydraulic powered to actually crush into them and do some damage. Yeah, and it's another one of those kind of robots you'd never guess the origin from, is that this was the Victor team, Series 2 and 3. Wow. I never... It's just nothing like it, like, at all. Like, Victor was this weird, like, coffin with, like, sideways wheels on it, while this thing's, like, a pretty competent crusher for Series 7. Hmm. Not bad. Yeah, I really like I, I quite liked Kraken. I think I also kind of liked the fact it was quite sleek as well. It wasn't like, yeah. there's a lot of crushes in the later series that were a bit awkward, that weren't Razor. It couldn't quite uh, crush people, could it? No, it wasn't as powerful. I mean, it kind of reminds a little bit of Ming 3 in a way. Um, yeah. The crushability factor, as JP would like to say, but yeah. I still quite enjoyed it. I, I, the, double, the double crusher was quite unique, at least. Yeah. yeah. Stay lobster because it was beaten by Thermidor 2. Uh, very appropriate for our podcast, then. <laughs> so it did lead to also a great JP quote, though. Kraken takes a right good smacking. Oh... Anything to add, Jonathan? Not really. It's um I mean it was a cool crush to, to see. It's always fun to see a crusher kind of come in and do some stuff, but no, I don't remember Kraken terribly well, if I'm being honest. And uh, moving on, we have Mantis. There's been quite a fair few robots called Mantis. I believe Anderson had one of those what robots he called Mantis, didn't he? I believe so, yes. Um Obviously, I know the current version of Mantis is owned by Alex Hall now, isn't it? Mantis, the Mantis 2 version of it. Mm. This one actually bears a sort of resemblance. It looks a bit like Tetanus and Rocks 2 sort of together, in a way. Yeah, again, I love that kind of uh, scrap look to it. It's mm. It's got a good design to it. And admittedly, I'm not the biggest fan of the, like, the, more, the second one they made, which is a bit too boxy in my liking. And while the original just had so much more look to it. Um, it just, and also I think it, I believe it won the crushing uh, special, didn't it? The like crushing fight they did, the um, rocks and pincer, I believe. I think they managed it, to win that. 
it, it, it won that, yep. It's pretty impressive, because, I mean, I'm not sure why Kraken wasn't in there, but... Um... I wonder. Reached the second round in the seventh round, where it was beaten by Cat 3. Yeah, it just got kind of axed a lot, didn't it, until it just... Uh... I mean, they had a fair play. They did lift uh, Cat 3 up on their side at one point. They uh, try. They definitely had a good go at it, but it was just it was just worn out, I think, by the, the lack of armor in it kind of was the biggest problem with it. I agree. Pretty much uh, that's all, all it would have taken. Tartarus, one last robot for Series 7. This one's quite hard to describe. It's a Dutch uh, robot. Yeah, it is a strange-looking robot. It it didn't last long in any of it, any of its appearances in like both the Dutch series and in the UK series, I believe it. It, it looks like a got... mutant Robo Chicken. Hmm. Yeah, it's a cooked Robo Chicken. <laughs> Just color wise, been basted or something. Ouch. But also, I remember this is um this robot was infamous for me anyway because in my um big bot quiz the uh, the year I, I did for with the the bit of the month one I did the about well, one last year for my chat on my channel. Um, this was the only Dutch robot that no one rem- no, none of the four teams remembered. Because I had to name any du- all the Dutch robots that appeared in the UK series, Series 7, and it was the only one that no one remembered, so I felt a bit bad for it. <laughs> and, I mean, despite its look, it's not the most memorable robot, but I don't know. It's kind of remember it, but I only remember it for being not very good. It is what it is. Um, so, moving on from Series 7, we then jump forward a good few years to the Reboot series. And there's not really many robots to speak of here because the field is so much smaller now. I'll give a passing mention to Draven because it has a sort of... It looks a bit kind of like a griffin with the sort of beak motif on it. And Draven actually appeared in Extreme 2, I believe. Yeah, they got beaten by um, King Buxton, one of um, one of King Buxton's very few solo wins post Series Three. Yeah, and so, then and then it goes yeah. out round one in both Series Eight and Nine. One at one point getting its receiver destroyed by Shunt's axe, and one very well placed hit. Yeah, I was actually there for that fight. Actually, I was there for the um, the two qualifying the opening matches for that heat. Oh yeah, um, when going to go and see it with Sam, but. Um, I was also there for that shot with the crackers or no smash getting ripped into the arena wall by Carbide. Mm. So, um, yeah, it was pretty. It was the sound it got, the sound that um, PP3D made when it crunched into the bottom of it was actually quite terrifying. It was so loud. Oh. Um, yeah. Because it, ripped, cause it basically ripped up the entire bottom like panel of it so it couldn't move very well. And it was like struggling to move. And then Shunt just whacked it on the top and then the receiver just died. It just killed the whole robot entirely. I believe it also got ripped apart by ripped a bit up by um, Mr. Speed Squared as well in Series Eight, but that, that that's how they went out in that series. Yeah, it just ha- it just had a problem with spinners. It didn't like spinners, and unfortunately, it kept getting fought against them all the time. It's a shame because it was a good looking machine. I say looks wise, it was good. I just don't. I mean, competitive wise, it was obviously a bit less so because of how thin the beak was. But I still like it. It was still a nice design, though. I did like it. So let's now talk about one of my favourite robots, um, one, of my most, one of the most inspired me anyway, um, even though it wasn't so successful in these runs. Foxic, um, built by Mr. Craig Danby, who appeared in the classic um, Robot Wars series, first with Anto in the Antweight event, and then he came along in a Featherweight event with Gianto, I believe. Not to great success, but this is the first time he really um, comes into his own in the Heavyweight events. With um, I think it was Foxic Mark II, as it was called at the time, a modular construction, and it had a sort of um, cute fox face motif on it, with two different types of lifters on it, one on the long arm and one that was a bit more short at the front. I I love, absolutely love the look of the uh, second Foxic. The second so Fox is beautiful, so sleek. I mean, obviously, they, it was their it was their spiritual like predecessor to Predator as well from BattleBots. And the, Foxtrot, um, yeah. And Foxtrot, yeah. It was a very, um, very sleek looking, and he was so unlucky how he went out. How he forgot how, one, how the the self self righted the little flipper didn't work because he then put a bolt in, I think, or something. It was something very yeah. very minor. I, and it was, it was quite flipper. it was quite depressing to see that. Um, of course, um, I liked that um, the robot community were quick to come out in defense of Craig Danby after uh, the series eight episode aired, making him look like some kind of pantomime villain. And the community pointed out he was actually very helpful to people in the pits and generally all around good guy. 
Yeah, it seems to happen a lot with Danby for some reason. He always seems to be betrayed as some kind of like villain or you know annoying like... person, but he seems like a really nice guy. That's the thing. I just think Craig is really passionate about the sport, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the passion of it, and it's understandable why if you put so much effort and time into a robot and rarely get any results out of it, it's a big shame. Which is why I was so happy with the Slamo finally getting a win for him in um, Battle Boxes. Doing yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, gained the top thirty-two. Fair play, you know. It's really good for him. Particularly for a very br- a brand new design, which had looked nothing like his previous robots, it was uh, very nice to see. But he tried something just... different. And innovation paid off. It was so annoying. It's such a shame though watching him beforehand, though, because like Series Eight, he had a really solid robot that just had problems with traction, mm-hmm. and didn't. And then in Series Nine, has a much more impressive looking robot, and it very sm- small error kicked him out. In Series Ten, yeah. he joined up with the Apex team. The robot self ex- it completely self destructs. <laughs> To tap, I believe he's made smaller versions of Fox, like like featherweight version or a beetleweight version or something. I believe so. And also, we have to give props to uh, Anthony Murney as well because his uh, signature robot Rusty is based off Foxic. Yes, which is, uh, a very very not nice looking. Uh, long, I, I call it an ant weight because it's an ant weight anarchy, but it's more of a uh, via class <laughs> by its weight. But it's still a beautiful looking robot, and it, it made a cameo in Series Ten on the uh, Push to Exit as well, which was nice to see. Definitely. I mean, a few people had unfavorably compared my first Beetleweight robot, Volpa, to like as a bargain basement sort of Foxic. But um, I, just, I mean, I wouldn't say that. No, I mean, I think Fox themed robots. Are, Fox is just really cool. It just as Craig Danby put it in an interview once before, and I think Foxic is one of the best, if not the best, looking animal themed robots that we still have going. And also, the pun is still really good as well. It is. Um, series nine. Another competitor we had, Jellyfish. This was Team Die Crazy Robotics' heavyweight entry. Of course, because um, originally Dave Law was part of um, Nuts in Series 8, and then branched off to make Jellyfish, which I adore this thing so much. Mm. I love this. It's got such spirit behind its design, doesn't it? It's, it's like the... if someone took an ant weight, like a really silly ant weight, and just made it a heavyweight. Like literally, mm. n- n- like just managed to make some kind of magic on it and just make it bigger and heavier. That's what I love mm-hmm. about it. And it was floppy as well. I love that about Jerry. Made of HDPE, so it could withstand axes and hammer weapons very, very well. Take impacts very well. Mm. And it had a kind of. Um, it reminds it. Its weapon was very reminiscent of a very old, um, the classic BattleBots competitor called the uh, Huggy Bear, I believe. Yeah. Where it has like one arm that kind of acts as a crusher on both sides as a kind of scans across and uh though we never saw jellyfish really be as effective i mean it's only real good fight was against david tooth which was already half dead from half to shock but um it was still fun to watch like it, it, it watching it go flying when the rapid flipped over and terror hitting it and knocking random bits off it was it's entertaining and also D- dave's a really fun sport with it as well i mean he is yeah Anthony, Great robot. Going back to Anthony Murney, of course, um, he built a Beetleweight version that was called Jelly, which he competed with in the Content Creator Rumble at RoboNerd. Ah, oh, yes, he did, didn't he? And that he, was uh, and fun. He, he came fifth, so just the head of um, of um, Pup Pup Dougal there. Um, he was put down the pit by Igor, and well, Igor tried to put him down the pit, but he couldn't get Jelly off of his forks. And then Volpa comes charging in behind and pushes them both in. <laughs> I always do feel with jellyfish that I mean, obviously I know it would kind of go against the ethos of jellyfish. Like anyone can make a robot for like very you know limited amount of money and stuff and basic you know very normal techniques. Um, this is the kind of robot I could see if it was like upgraded to like BattleBots level of competitiveness. It could be really effective. Uh, yeah. It's got like a really good like uh, idea for the weapon. Maybe like it, I, I was I always see this thing as a very similar to um, not in weapon wise but just kind of size wise. A bit like a two-headed death flamingo as well, with a kind of wide base and uh, replace obviously the pickers with a, a little gra- like a kind of a grabber. But it's I, I do li- I do like the potential of this robot, and it's a it's a big shame that Jellyfish Two was uh, didn't qualify for Series Ten. It so is I, because I remember seeing pictures of that thing and going, that looks so much more improved than this version, mm. and it just didn't get in unfortunately because of the limited amount of robots. Yeah, same reason why Fox didn't get in as well. Wasn't selected for series ten. Mm, bit of a shame. It is. Uh, Mega Mouse. This was like the successor to the Mighty Mouse robots. 
Yeah, and it made less impression than the Mighty Mouse, unfortunately. How did Mega Mouse called Charles? It looked like a cheese wedge. Didn't Mega Mouse also have the um, had false wheels externally? Didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. It was a it was a very um, it was definitely a bit of an upgrade compared to the original one, but mm. of course it, it had to go against Carbide. Mm. I think first it was all, also fresh first, from the live circuit yeah. as well. I think it was quite extensively used on the live circuit before arriving on in Robot Wars. Piloted by no other than Ching Liu. Yeah, and it also came uh, third in 2016, I believe. So it actually had like... Um, the robot had potential, but the, yeah, its biggest issue was to put against Carbide. You know, its other two opponents were um, Broly Rage and Crackers and Smash, who weren't the biggest threats. And all it took was one... And Spinny Boy to come in and completely ruin it. So, we're going to give a few more quick honorable mentions for the reboot series. Toron, which was Tom Brewster's um, robot before he made Monsoon, had kind of a loose sort of bull theme. Um, Worm, which was um, named after a dragon, um, built by the team that had made Overdose of a Series 8. Coyote, built by Jamie McHarg. Um, doesn't really look like a coyote, but it's got a wonderful steampunk aesthetic and has a Roadrunner-shaped robot called Roadrunner. It was also the last robot to use a chainsaw as well. I mean, mostly more for aesthetic than actual damage, but it was still nice to see one of those make a I return somewhere. I think an art bot. I would describe it as such. I mean, it's very, mm. very uh, nice looking. Oh. So I'm not just totally saying that because uh, I've got a bit of the robot right here, just saying that... Yeah, it's. Uh... <laughs> Last cool. but not least, I'll give a shout to Bucky the Robot as well, based on some false teeth. Okay, it's not an animal, but they had an animalistic style mascot, like the anthropomorphized it. It stares into your soul for all eternity. And then it swallows your soul. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, there are some promotional shots of it, and occasionally in the heat, where, uh, in the heat where um, you can see the face of the guy inside, and it's even more terrifying somehow. Just out of interest, when do you think the golden. The Golden Series for uh, animal theme designs was. I would say Series Three because that was the real Barnyard Series, as uh, we pointed out earlier. Yeah, I mean, I go by my nickname, my, my um, said nickname of it. I have to agree, just because. To be honest, here, it the most the, the most fun and most creative looking design wise ones came from Series Three. That's um, where the most robots came through, really, for this uh, particular episode. The most robots. I mean, only maybe Series Seven and. Maybe possibly four after them. How I'll have as just as many, but series three was definitely one of the best designs. Definitely the big one, yeah. Can I also throw a curveball for two robots which we've not covered? Okay. What about two robots? One called Growler, one called Matilda. Oh yes, of course. Forgot about them. The house robots. How do we forget about Growler and Matilda? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's... Owl is literally the pet of Mr. Psycho, so. Yeah. Lots of skid steer system in it, and they edited a dog noise whenever it moved its jaws. Imagine if Growler had been like a regular competitor and like reduced the weight of it down. It would be so good. It would be fantastic. And at the same time, Matilda. I mean. It's basically it's... Pitbull on steroids, don't you think? Growler. Okay, it reminds me a little bit more. Actually, it'll be a combination of like Pitbull and Quantum from uh, BattleBots. In a way. Mm. Yeah, indeed, except it's more designed to hold as opposed to eat. <laughs> it, it chomps, not noms. That's the difference. Yes. And Matilda, though, damn, she 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 got she out of all the house robots. I think arguably maybe Dead Metal got the biggest improvements between one series to the next. I mean, the flywheel. I'd argue dead. that. Yeah, I'd argue that Matilda is the most dangerous of all the house robots, especially following her flywheel. The one that's she was definitely one that could do the most damage, at least. Anyway, I mean, series five, uh, she had the flywheel for the first time and she knew when to use it because so many robots got completely eviscerated just by her running into it alone. I mean, Firestorm, Wither's Revenge, Supernova, Rohog, um, even me, three, which is unfair, unfair, but still funny. And or the be or the best one though, which was probably one of the more salty ones, but still very funny, was Micro Mute. Uh, oh, Circular Lot lifted it up and then hit fed it into the spinner. It was I, it was understandable. I can understand why the guy was sad. It was upsetting, but gotta admit it was kind of funny in a morbid way, even if it was very sad. 
And she's the only house robot that was made into a Hexbug toy. And also the only house, but uh, the only the first house robot to get flipped over by a competitor because yeah. uh, Recyclops in Series One did that, which is uh, kind of impressive for Series One anyway. It showed you how ahead of the curve Rex Garrod was at least. But she's definitely my favorite. I think her and Dead Metal are probably my two favorite house robots, just for the fact Dav- how improved they got. Yeah, Dead Metal's my overall favorite, but Matilda's right up, right up behind. Yeah. I'd probably say Growler's third. They're, I think they're my top three, probably. I just think they're overall more most balanced house robots. Maybe Shunt. I do like Shunt as well. The rest of my cat, they're okay. I uh, say it's a tie between Shunt and Dead Metal for me. Shunt has the best... I think Shunt has some of the best, like, classic moments overall, yeah. but Build is probably the most destructive, and I'd say Dead Metal's... I think Dead Metal was the balance, because I think I remember um, the production crew said if you could have any of the house robots as a competitor, he would choose Dead Metal. Yeah, to how low to the ground and how offensive it is. So, yeah. I see that. So, I think it's time we wrapped up this episode. It's a very long episode. So, I just want to say, I was Mark Smith, aka Free Fox. Thanks for tuning in. If you're, indeed you're still listening, thank you for to Jono for um, his contributions as well. It's always good to have you. No problem at all. Thank you so much for having me again. Yeah, and thank you, Jim Jamatic, for joining me on one of my podcasts at last. It was finally great to be able to get you to join one of mine for a change. It was very fun, and uh, finally glad to be here. So uh, thank you. It was really enjoyable. Great stuff. And stay safe, everyone, and happy robot-earing.